It's because he remembered. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, uh, I'm really very, very happy to be uh, presenting here. Uh, I am uh, one of those who uh, has approached this in a little bit of a selfish way, in the sense that uh, uh, I am uh, going to be trying to uh, put uh, Paul's uh, work to use in my own uh, projects and uh, um, so hopefully uh, you will find these ideas um, stimulating to some extent, very much work in progress. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hear uh, what you have to say. And I'm also happy to, to follow Sene's uh, presentation. Uh, I thought it was uh, really interesting and uh, uh, extremely illuminating. I'm, uh, I don't think there's going to be that much overlap, and even though we're going to talk about similar things, I've tried to sort of find a way for the two to, to fit together. So, as has been uh, discussed, uh, there is a, a certain tension in Paul's work in the sense that it is both about America, uh, but also about how to study law. And so, both sort of serve to produce a, a portrait of the American legal imagination, but it also proposes uh, a roadmap to access these uh, deep um, myths and these beliefs about the law that shape uh, how particular cultures see themselves and their place in the world. So it's on this second aspect that I'm going to be focusing on, and of course, as applied to the, uh, to EU, uh, to the EU law. Uh, so why? And now the starting point is, uh, and this is how I first became interested in what work, in, is that the diagnosis that, uh, uh, or begins with uh, of American legal scholarship as caught between this internal perspective that has the same relation to law and you know the divinity schools have to religion and a sort of an external perspective that denies any real autonomy to law and I find that this sort of um, uh, dilemma applies very well to EU law and I, I know of no other field where uh, the uh, there has been such frustration about the inability of, of uh, EU law scholarship to take distance from the object of their study. And while at the same time, there's also a parallel uh, tendency to, to try and critically see EU law as, let's say, a surface phenomenon, an instrument of governance, uh, that kind of thing. So it's a, been a complaint that has been uh, around for a while, and perhaps it seemed uh, destined to disappear uh, after, let's say, let's say the fiasco of the constitutional project or, or, or something like that. But in fact, we, we see that it's, it's even more the case today, I find uh, the intensity, uh, for instance, around the debate on the rule of law. Uh, you know, now uh, academics are constantly being called upon to, to sign collective letters, uh, uh, you know, as EU law, I have to say that this and that. So, I, I think that this suggests that there is a space and there is need for a cultural analysis of EU law, the one that takes it seriously as articulating an autonomous and idiosyncratic worldview, whilst at the same time trying to approach it with as much scientific agnosticism as we can. So without trying to seek it to reconstruct it rationally or push it in a certain direction. So how then does this work uh, help us understand EU law, and I think essentially in, in two ways. The first is by providing us with a series of concepts and above all, series of dichotomies of, of oppositions to you know, uh, lead us in, in this, uh, locate, in locate, to locate the deep myths on which EU law is based as a system of belief. And secondly, also by pointing us to the importance of sacrifice that it plays. And my central contention is or, or hypothesis is that the, the culture of EU law, first of all, is characterized by some collapse of key oppositions found in, in, Paul, in Paul's work. And secondly, that sacrifice, uh, and here I'm gonna connect well with Sinner's work, is that sacrifice plays an increasingly important role in the maintenance of the European project. So as developed, for instance, in, in the reign of law, which is, is the book that I've read most recently, uh, even though it's one of the older books, uh, the, the central conflict is between uh, revolution and the rule of law, between revolutionary politics and the politics of the rule of law. And so this gives way to a, a series of, of dichotomies. On the one hand, on, sort of the, 
on the side of the rule of law, it's characterized by a morality of loyalty to the past, impersonality, and it's representative polity, and whereas revolutionary politics are based on responsibility towards future generations, politics of personal distinction, and finally, an ontology of instantiation. So as I'm quoting, as the experience of meaning is not detachable from the embodied forms in which it presents itself. And I think this is very important for reasons that I will explain. And so this is because, as, as he describes, so in the American legal imagination, the two uh, can be, uh, only be understood in confrontation to each other. But I think their interdependence goes further than that. There can be no rule of law without a revolutionary origin. But on the other hand, uh, conversely, revolution cannot succeed without transitioning into a stable rule of law. And now, what, as I said, what's notable about the experience of the reign of law in the EU is that it can simultaneously appear as the two, as both forward-looking action and a backward-looking order. And I think that this, I think this is a point that I, I want to underline, I think, or I want to propose is that I think this can be best appreciated if we consider the particular position in which EU law finds itself in sort of somewhat spatial terms as occupying this in-between space that's delineated by a double border. So there's an internal border that sets it apart from the legal orders of member states. But then there's also an external border to separate it from the outside world, these sort of third, third countries. And I think both are essential to the emergence, to the identity of EU law. EU law cannot be confused with a mere extension of national legal cultures, national legal orders, but neither can it appear as the expression of pure managerialism, pure technocratic intervention, for then it would dissolve in universal reason. So, what, is in, what I want to say is that I think to maintain this in-between space, EU law tends to play one against the other. And I think this is, it has this Janus space quality to EU law as simultaneously uh, being and action that renders Paul's opposition a little bit harder to apply, but I think no less, they're no less revealing of the or originality of the EU law uh, as a system of belief. And that, crucially, I want to suggest that sacrifice plays a key role in the maintenance of both of these, the internal border and the, and the external border. So on the one hand then, in this from the internal perspective against member states, EU law does appear very much in the form, you know, to take those categories of revolutionary politics. And I, I think three aspects here that I want to uh, underline. The first is that EU law appears as a commitment then to a certain project. Uh, and the realization of this project lies forever in the future. I think this is quite important. So while every development of EU law is necessarily a step in that direction, and, and the Treaty of the European Union, the language that says it's a new stage in the process of creating an ever closer union, uh, the actual realization of this project will always remain in, in the horizon. It's, it's a march that is a sort of an endless one. So that doesn't mean that the European project is viewed as a mythical utopia. It's very much understood to be a, a real possibility, even if it in, lies in the future. So I think the EU would become something completely different from what it is, both if you know, this promised land were suddenly considered to have been reached. You know, suddenly the, the, the land that we're standing on, this is the one that we've been looking for. So it became a present reality, but it also would become something completely different if suddenly we understood it only as a theoretical possibility rather than a real one. So that's the first thing. And secondly, I think in its commitment to the realization of the European project, I think it's interesting that EU law sweeps through legal orders as uh, of, the, of the member states as a form of purposeful action. So it's not just that the project calls for constant action, but it's also that this action is a legal one, necessarily a legal one. So it's not, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the theme of integration through law, it's so important. Law is not just a means to an end. It's the commitment to legal action that defines the EU, that is to say European integration is law. 
So it's not just integration to law, but integration is law. So the function is, you know, function is paradigm that's so dominant, uh, or has been traditionally so dominant, it, it will almost seem like the intervention of EU law acts as an external force to bring about certain results. But in fact, and here I again go back to uh, Paul's categories, I think that what you can see is that the action is not just an external force that brings about certain results, it instantiates the EU project. That project exists only as embodied in EU law. And that's why the effectiveness is of the essence in uh, EU law. It is, it has an existential quality and a word that keeps coming up. Uh, and conversely, I would say, this is why the failure of EU law translates into the negation of the European project. So member states do not simply fall foul of EU law, they situate themselves outside of Europe uh, by, through their resistance to EU law, and therefore the EU shrinks as a result of this resistance. So the internal market evaporates or its values retreat. And so when we talk about Hungary and Poland, the rule of law backsliding, we have said, for instance, that this is a de facto withdrawal from the EU. Or we say that for Greece, uh, you know, that the alternatives to austerity was either Brexit or the EU's disappearance. <clears throat> Third point is that sacrifice, uh, I think, does play a key role in maintaining the European project. And it does so, I, I believe, by playing the role of elevating this project from one of individual betterment, this is a word that's sometimes used, to one of collective transformation. And this may have seen, as Zeno was saying very well, this, this has seemed unthinkable for a long time. It's been commonly said that the legitimacy of the EU is entirely output-based, that it can only be justified on the basis of a, sort of a banal or an entirely benign individual improvement. And so there's a, a project that has no past, no history. It's not any one that anybody can connect with, etc. or therefore not one that one can be uh, willing to suffer for. Uh, and yet, I think it's become gradually too obvious that the action of EU law is transformational rather than simply one for individual uh, uh, betterment. And also that, the, and therefore, that the commitment to the European project demands also suffering and sacrifice. So now this, there's been so attempts to first rationalize this through, for instance, drawing on a kind of a transactional logic as in liberal constitutionalism. And I think a good example, I don't know if Miguel is here, uh, uh, is the, the infamous uh, Viking case. So in in the opinion uh, uh, in the opinion of uh, in his opinion in that case he he argued that that uh, the European project is based on a social contract where uh, workers need to accept the negative consequences of integration and in exchange uh, the EU agrees to protect them and guarantee their prosperity. So now the problem is that the austerity when I think it's well, that, that opinion can be discussed, but when it comes to the austerity that followed, and Marco has argued this very well, uh, austerity program cannot be rationalized as a quid pro quo. It is demanded of citizens, or at least of some citizens, that they endure uh, very uh, considerable well, financial hardship in this case, not in order to obtain a benefit that's commensurate with their loss, but to maintain the European project. So as a form of self-transcendence, I think Moshe was using this word here. Now, this is from the sort of the inside perspective, I was, the, the, the idea of the internal border that I was mentioning. Against the outside world, however, I think that the EU, EU law projects itself very differently. Now, the, the functionalist paradigm that I've already mentioned is so strong that the EU's uh, the, the relationship of EU law to the rest of the world will often be described exactly in the same terms as this. Uh, so there is speak, for instance, of EU as, as a global actor, a one whose actions are so effective that it's able to promote its values everywhere, uh, or even emerge as a sort of a 
a benign hegemon or something for the benefit of all. Uh, now, I think that externally, EU law actually projects itself not as transformative action, as we had, as I had explained before, but instead as a stable and hard order, or as, as a hard aki, which is a word that's very common. And now this applies both to the people that are aspiring to join, but also to the rest of the world, towards the, the former, these candidate countries. Uh, the defining feature of, of the accession procedure is not a, a forward-looking commitment, but a backward-looking loyalty to this aki, which is non-negotiable. And towards you know, to the outside world, you know, the extension of EU law is not a further stage in the realization of the European project. And it's vice versa, it's shrinking does not signify its demise or its negation. Instead, I believe that the, it, you know, it's rather than instantiating the European project, the question is one of belonging and hence it's not a representational question. Who does EU law speak for? And it's by defining what lies outside of its mantle that EU law hardens into an order. It ceases to instantiate a, a particular project and comes instead to represent a concretely situated political unity. And I think, I will conclude with this, I think that here sacrifice again plays a very key role, even if perhaps, I mean, uh, perhaps in a more, you know, Michael was talking about Girard yesterday, in a more Girardian sense, maybe sacrifice in terms of victimization to preserve internal cohesion. And I'm thinking here of, uh, of the migrants who sails across the Mediterranean only to be denied the benefit of the EU law, perhaps to drown in the sea. And it is this victimization, this, this somewhat perverse ex, uh, expulsion that I think that tragically allows the EU to appear as a uh, hardened political order. Um, that's it. Hello. Your reaction. Okay, so uh, these papers are well beyond my field of expertise or competence. So I could be completely off in, the oh, yes, in, in what I what I say. So there's no more kind of, uh, reaction to questions beyond you know where's France. Um, <laughs> but but um, listening to your paper, um, I I kept wondering about the following. Um, is there an assumed uh, uh, identity between, or uh, is there any distance between the idea of being a European uh, and membership in the EU? Uh, because I kept wondering whether, you know, what the Ukrainian claim was, is we're Europeans, uh, and, and whether the perception from Europe of the Ukrainians and the difference in reaction to them uh, as as refugees, is they're Europeans as opposed to people from the, the Middle East or, or somewhere other other sorts of refugees. But that's a different question, a different kind of idea, at least in, in my initial thought. Um, then we also want to be members of the European Union, um, which is a set of institutional relationships that people, kind of governments, have complicated relationships to. And um, I imagine you can be a European and not be a member of the European Union. I imagine Hungary might might end up in that state Fine, or something. Britain. But Britain, Britain, Britain. I wasn't <laughs> sure if, if Britain thinks of themselves as European, but I certainly wondered about that. So, so, and so, I wondered about um, the relationship between this idea of political identity and this set of in, in, institutions, is because the, the the claim for the institution can have a lot of, you know, very. Um, you know, practical reasons tech, uh, about why you want to get the benefits of this set of, set of institutions. But the, the, the deeper claim is one about identity. Uh, and I wondered how these two things were interacting. Uh, on the institutional, your tripart type set of distinctions, which I found were really quite interesting, uh, I wasn't really sure uh, that it captured something European. Um, uh, because in here, here, you know, you're a comparativist. Um, I think one could make the same set of distinctions if one thought about um, 
both Latin American, South American relationships, you know more about this than me, uh, to, to international or transnational institutions. Um, there's a similar motivation when I speak to my friends in Argentina uh, about anchoring the political order in some set of international institutions, human rights institutions. It's gonna you know, keep out uh, uh, the, or, or prevent the return to a past, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, and then there's also a concern about you know, uh, autonomy from in intervention by others. Only now it's the American hegemon. You know, uh, we're worried about the Americans coming and we want to set of international institutions that's going to constrain them. And, and then there's the uh, countries that say, well, there's a lot of benefits for us uh, in this, but, but really, you know, we have our own autonomous uh, uh, constitutional uh, uh, evolutionary order. Uh, you talk, you know, to Colombians and they tell you that they're the oldest democracy in Latin, Latin America. So, so that element's also uh, running around. So, so, so my sense was, um, yeah, these are three elements that are important, um, but they may be quite independent of, you know, the European project, and, but in the sense of, um, you know, showing up whenever we create a transnational institutional set of options. Um, these are the ways that countries will think about their relationship to them. So I think, so, so those were my thoughts. That, you know, what, what, what about identity? I, I too, you know, I, I got in this big argument a couple of weeks ago with somebody, I don't remember who, in which I they said, isn't this terrible the way the Europeans are welcoming the Ukrainians? Uh, but they had such a negative reaction uh, to the Syrians. And I said, well, I'm not so sure that's terrible. Uh, I said, yeah, well, of course it's terrible if you're from a, the perspective of the refugee, but it, what it shows us is that the idea of the European yeah. is growing. But I didn't say the idea of European Union is growing. I said the idea of you know, who's a member you know, you know, how far your, you know, identity community extends is expanding. And, and I thought, you know, given the history of Europe, uh, in, in which there's been such bloody contestation over who, who's a member, this is, this in the longer run is a good thing. Um, I may have lost that argument, but, but at least I, I, I wanted to suggest the alternative that, you know, what's going on here is, is, is the projection of the growth of an idea of identity. Um, uh, and I love them. So, so uh, I'm not, and I'm not sure how that relates to European Union membership. Uh, so you know, I've talked about NATO, uh, which is interesting to the American, uh, of course. Uh, and then at the last last point. Um, so these are you know very stirring remarks by Ursula von, von der Leyen, uh, but Joe Biden could have said that word for word. Uh, and, and he's not he, he's not thinking about joining the European Union. <laughs> uh, and he's not thinking about being European, uh, but he is thinking about freedom is priceless. Uh, we're defending democracy. There's a, a international conflict here between two different systems of order. Um, so there's, there's nothing here that I, in either of these statements I read that I thought Joe Biden couldn't, couldn't easily say. Um, so uh, those are my thoughts. Uh, on the Tony's paper, I'm really even further out of my field. <laughs> but, but I only had one real thought about this, although I found it all interesting. Um, so of course you're right in, a, right in a really interesting way that this distinction that I make between revolution and law, um, between modes of action, ways of looking, all of this, um, it's an abstraction um, that doesn't necessarily track the phenomena because what you're suggesting is, look, you can, you can think about law as a way of doing things. You can think about law uh, as, as itself a kind of a project uh, and move it. You know? So one of the ways we act in the world is we act through law. And that becomes particularly important when we think about uh, law as, as, a, as a kind of legal intervention from outside. I can aggressively use law to extend, expand what I call a project. So that's really interesting, I, I, I thought. But, but then I started thinking about, um, again, just the comparative sense of how much of what you're saying um, is unique uh, to the European experience, like the configuration of the EU at the moment. And I thought, well, I'm not so sure. Um, uh, because I wondered, and I started wondering if you looked at the first decades of the American experience, um, 
in, in which you had you know states uh, struggling um, with this new entity and, and people like John Marshall trying to invent the rule of law. They must have understood that he was doing something aggressive with law as a, a kind of an intervention from outside in the same kind of way in, in which there's an internal and external border. And, and um, so I wondered if what you were really doing is not uh, giving us a, an interesting, I mean, you're giving us an interesting description of the European Union, but, but giving us an interesting kind of description of um, what it means to be in the early decades of, of constructing a constitutional project of a certain sort, uh, and whether these same phenomena that you're describing couldn't be located if you looked at, you know, let's say the period from you know, 1800 to 1830 uh, in, in the US, which, which leads, leads me to a, a final question, which is kind of a, a question for all of you Europeans. Uh, <laughs> Who says we're yeah. Europeans? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, one thing I'm hearing from all, all of this, and may, maybe it's just the, the Ukrainian moment, there's a, um, you know, the question that has been hanging around in my, in the periphery of my awareness as I've dealt with Europeans for a long time is, um, is the European Union moving towards being a state? You know, is that, is that what we see here? Uh, is, or is this federation a, a stable point? Uh, uh, or um, is, is, is there a, a kind of an internal trajectory uh, that, um, you know, that, that um, the you know we, we saw in the, in the 19th century because I, I think it takes you know 100 years for the U.S. to become a state. Uh, is that is that the movement that you're basically describing in the early decades? Uh, uh, of? Anyway, that that that's not very. Uh, I want, let me just I have one other thought. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, never mind. Uh, okay, that's 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 all I have to contribute. Good. So, should we have a, a quick reply from both? And then I'll... I mean, just first, I mean, that's what my book about. Like the, the, last, the last thing you're setting out is really okay. to do a comparison to the early history of the United States. Okay, and, I'll get the book. And so, so I think that that would my, 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 my answer would be yes. Exactly. Um, so that's the first point. I think the other things you asked me more particular, I think in a sense there, I think what you what you touch upon is perhaps uh, something that might be actually about Europe and not about what I would call federations um, or federal unions because of uh, something we talked about yesterday actually at dinner about there's this um, connection in intellectual history between Europe, civilization and sovereignty. And between what, sorry? Europe, civilization, yep. and sovereignty that sort of are bound together but also transformed all the time. And, you know, we, we see that today in terms of like how the European project, to what extent it sort of is a representation of Europe, right? So the accession criteria to become a member state of the European Union, you have to be a European state. But what does that mean? <laughs> it's not a geographical question only for sure. It's also a question about civilization being a certain kind of state. So, and I think what I tried to, to point out in the Ukrainian example is that Europe and the European Union are used synonymously or as a synonyms, they're, they're the same thing. To be, become European, you have to be a member state of the European Union. But at the same time, they, you have to be European to join, right? So it's, it's sort of, it's a difficult question about identity that, that on the one hand, and, and the way it works for the most part in Eastern Europe is seen as a, as a question of destiny. Only a European state can, be a member state of the European Union because it's already European, but it's also realizing its Europeanness by joining. So it's mm -hmm. in that sense, it's a world myth. Mm -hmm. that you become what you were always meant to be, mm -hmm. then you're somehow denied. So this is also why they talk about the return to Europe, right? That they, they have been a part of Europe, but they have been denied that civilization which was their own, in a sense. So I think this is what is playing out here, but it's it's a it's a wonderful question you ask because it's very complex. And there's a lot of historical depth there that, that I'm still thinking about a lot and trying to, to understand. Um, so I think that that's, a, that's my, my short and, and not very sort of full answer to a very complex and very good question. Um, but 
I think the last one you, you asked me about Joe Biden, I think, I think you're completely right, but that also says something about this moment, right? This is a presidential address in that sense. This is what she's trying to do. This is a kind of being a masterpiece, but this is, this is the kind of thing she's making. I mean, like you, you, might, you might say that it's... I could get up and make claim, but I have no authority. Where's the authority? She doesn't have any power. <laughs> well, I, I think a lot of Russians would disagree. Does she have a What's the last thing you said? Just don't have any power. Um, I think that the, the, the last point, or like the second point you made about, and I'm just going to move move past. <laughs> oh, God, because I haven't had my turn yet. <laughs> yes. We'll come back to that. Uh, about, about the variety, so the three ideal types. So that comes from what, you know, so in EU law, um, it's assumed that there's a constitutional homogeneity amongst the member states. That's what EU law tells us. So, it, you know, the Court of Justice will talk about uh, constitutional traditions that are common to the member states that are shared by the member states right? and the shared constitutional values, which are set out in Article 2 of the treaties. Um, but my point, what I do in, in, in this work is really to say, okay, but all the member states think of themselves as uh, constitutional democracies, but they really mean very different things when they say that. So in that sense, it's similar to what you suggest, say, compared to constitutional law in a new key, but we can't assume that the same worldview is shared, even though we use the same concepts in a sense. So the point with, with that work is, is, is not, is really to say, and I think you make that point really nice in that article and say, okay, or perhaps if you put that to reformers and say, well, you should know that the world's a bit more complicated. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't have a solution, but uh, we can't just assume that, that the problem will go away just because we don't like it. Or we can't just assume that the member states actually share the same constitutional worldview. So we have to deal with it somehow. I, I don't know what we're supposed to do about it, but. I think it's important that we, we deal with it and think about it. Uh, and, and the point really here about the European point is to say, well, I mean, something that I think is ignored is the fact that in the European Union, sort of the two levels are very interlinked, not, not just uh, you know, in governmental terms or in legal terms, but also symbolically. And this is what I try to get at, right? that Europe is not for most member states, it's not seen as something external. I mean, this is very much the case in the UK right? and, and in Denmark, where I'm from. You know, it's, it's always also over there. But in many ways, it's, it's seen as part of the project. You know, sometimes in tension with other aspects, but, but it's not foreign in that way. So this is just what I want to get out of. And what do you make of the question about uh, Latin American comparisons? Yeah, so I think it's an interesting point. And um, uh, one comment I've had also to what I was doing was saying, okay, is, are you sort of trying to create sort of different models for, you know, global constitutionalism? Or, and, and, and it could be, this could be appropriated in different contexts. I would be completely fine with that. But the reason I'm doing it is to, to try to understand the European Union, because that's what I, what I work on. But I would by no means be surprised if there was you know, similar views and resonance with like other, because many of these experiences have been shared, right? Many of them. So, so I'm not in any way confusing that with it. Um, yeah. um, I suppose, um, I don't, I don't quite, I'm not a, a combined, I'm not a constitutional scholar. <laughs> and uh, I don't, um, know enough about the early days of America to uh, uh, to say if this applies. I would my my hunch would ever however be that there is something specific to, to, to uh, the European experience that doesn't quite match with mm -hmm. with that uh, early or late 18th century or early 19th century America or even indeed Every sort of early day project of 
perspective, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Catalan, that is, I, I, I've grown up in a culture of, uh, you know, we're always in the early days of something that will one day come in the future. Uh, and, but, and, you know, there's this constant talking in general of uh, fe país, uh, you know, fe país uh, constructs the country. Like we need to, uh, we're all constantly constructing the country, uh, which already exists in our ideal mind, but it's not there yet. However, there is a difference between that and what I'm describing, and I assume also in the uh, in the in the American case, I I, I think well, a was in, specific to the European case is that a the this transformational you know uh, quality is very much inscribed in it. I don't know if maybe you can tell me or or we can have chat about it later if this was already. Uh, a feature of uh, the experience of early Americans and that they were several steps away from an, a future that had to be still constructed, that uh, that the project was one of still uh, in the still in the becoming project. I, I'm not sure about that, I wonder. And secondly, also, for instance, against that like Catalan experience, the, the European, uh, the, the place of law is different in the sense that EU law in the European, instantiates the, the European project. It's not just a matter of thinking of law in, in instrumental terms. I think it's very different because if you think of law in instrumental terms, uh, uh, law acts externally on, uh, it's like, like a sort of a, a, like any form of, you know, taking the cup and, and putting it in a, uh, in a different, but the uh, EULA doesn't just push things, it is only through its action that things become. And they become, as you say, in, in the sort of, in the, dimen in the finite dimension of, of the world. And they do not become if that action does not happen. So I think that's different. And, and so it is that, uh, you know, I, uh, this is the sacrificial dimension. I think it is increasingly evident that people are being called upon to, uh, for some form of renunciation for that project to happen one day in the future. And uh, I, again, I think that this is characteristic. Great. Right, well, you know, I don't know enough particularly right off the top of my head to be able to draw the parallels. But this sounds very much like, to me, uh, like the early American project, which makes me want to, to really think about you know, in both of these. Uh, what are the kind of large scale structural uh, implications that are, so I, I fear I'm becoming a bridge hack in the talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something I've always resisted. Uh, so when you think of the early days, what, what are the days? Well, for example, it, it was not, uh, the people were not at all certain about how long it would take for the Constitution to stabilize. So, you know, so now we have a constitutional amendment process, right, which is never used. It's much too complicated. Uh, but the early thought was it would be used a lot. You know, um, uh, so, you know, we have 12 amendments in the first, you know, 20 years or, 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 or less. Uh, you look at the early deb debates over uh, in the um, Monroe administration, which is, you know, in the 18 teens. Um, and they're very much thinking about, do we, do we need constitutional amendment to carry out infrastructure projects? So the, the distinction between, you know, making the law and applying the law or having a law that's stable or a project that's you know still projected in the future is, is very much alive uh, in these in, in these years and, and then in the reign of law I talk about the way in which um, Chief Justice Marshall thinks of himself still as a, as a founder right doing doing the same sort of thing um, and, and then and then this all gets swept up into the abolitionist debate which is all about you know well, what what is, is the project done what is the project you know how we do this you know Lincoln's idea that you know we need to put slavery on the road to extinction. You know, as if, well, we know what we're supposed to become. We're supposed to become a nation of free citizens, right? So in which slavery has no part. But that's 
that's a project, that's a legal project in some way. Um, but it's still projected always uh, in, into the future. Uh, uh, so, so if you looked at this period, you know, the antebellum period you know, from 1800 to, to, you know, to Dred Scott, let's say, uh, it's 1857. I have a sense that the categories would have something of the shape of this, you know, emerging idea of, of sacrifice, which of course is drawn between for some time between the state and the nation, uh, and this idea of giving up your statehood, your identity for a national identity. This is all going on, uh, and um, so so I wonder, um, you know, whether it's a mistake to go down that road and say, well. You know, you miss too much if you just try and impose some general categories, or, 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 or whether the suggestion of your paper is no, actually, there's there's something to be thought about in the you know comparative early constitutionalism, or maybe it's comparative federalism, federalism projects or something like that that's causing the same kinds of dynamics. Uh, yeah, that's open to the debate. So we have me, Martin. Alex and then I think Amar. Yeah. Mm. So these were great papers. And uh, just very, very quickly on, I've always thought the problem with the, the, the argument approach to this is that he only looks at one side of it. And he looks at the development of the, let's call it the federal or the supranational imagination. <laughs> he doesn't look so much about the comparisons with the, the other side, the national political imagination. And to me, the disanalogy between small night watchman state colonies in the 18th century and Europe, you know, at the center of the development of the complex nation state with everything that's associated with that. It's just so fantastically different. It doesn't mean that there aren't developments in say at the supranational side. You can actually right, draw right. the analogy there. I think the counterpoint looks very, very different. But anyway, the, the, you know, this is it's a big debate. The, a couple of points, one on, on uh, uh, you know, I think I want to hear more about evolutionary constitutionalism, right? Because it seems to me that what you do really well with the two, with uh, the post fascist and the post communist, is that you, you explain why Europe is internal to the imagination, to the constitutional imagination, right? It just it becomes internalized, becomes part of it. You know, you cannot, you cannot exercise, you cannot articulate, you cannot develop, express your sense of your constitutional identity without reference to the European project. That is not what you're saying about evolution of constitutionalism. Right? What you're saying there is that uh, the EU is a kind of addendum, yeah, it's something there, it's an extra thing, it's an economic project, whatever, you know, and, and I think that's, I think it's a kind of general insight about how Europe was approached by Scandinavia and by the UK. I think that's true. I think one of the reasons why Brexit happened was that, you know, the most that uh, anyone could actually mobilize in favor of the EU was a kind of indifference. And yeah, you know, there are certain economic benefits, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and that, that's, that's very interesting, you know, that the, the, it never actually became internalized within the project. I think in France it did. Yeah, yeah. There's a different story about France here, but, you know, the, the, there is something very interesting about you know, a project which has become so radically politicized, you know, in many parts of Europe, but actually one of the reasons why it's failing is that precisely as it moved forward institutionally in terms of powers, it failed to convince a quite large block of Europe that could be conceived of as a political project at all. So there's a really odd kind of disjunction there. Uh, I think also though, the, 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 on, Tony, on Tony's paper, it, it strikes me that I mean, first of all, I really agree with you about the law stuff. I think that's really important. You know, the, the Joseph Weiler once said, you know, that, that uh, uh, law is both the means and object of integration, right? And I thought, yeah, you're right. It, it's instrumental to integration. But it's also, it's, you know, in terms of the, the shiny cultural totemic objects that we associate with, in, with, with uh, European political identity, they have a very, very strong legal hue to them, you know. It's the area of freedom, security, and justice. It's the failed constitution itself. It's the Treaty of Maastricht. It's this, that, you know, it's, it's a European single currency. It's things which are very, very close to their legal definition of themselves. You know, and I think there's something really, really significant about that. I think part of the significance goes to this question. You're talking about the relationship between Europe and the European Union. It's a really fascinating question because 
The day after Brexit, Boris Johnson said in his inimitable style, we're not leaving Europe, we're leaving the European Union, you know, and uh, at that point I thought, yeah, okay, you're actually saying something which is very important here, which is there was always a narrow definition of Europe, which didn't go to the political imagination at all. And that narrow definition of it as a narrow economic project always coexisted with a broader cultural project about European civilization, right? And one of the things that happened over the following 50 years was that at various points, people would try to draw the cultural project into an economic project, see it as part of it. Other people would say, no, no, these are two quite distinct projects. With sometimes, so sometimes quite ironic consequences, such that someone like Boris Johnson could actually say that, that there's quite a strong cultural sense of Europeanness, let's call it a social sense of Europeanness, but it shouldn't be seen as, as a political project. I think, though, one of the things that Ukraine does, you know, I mean, I think in answer to your question, is that the, the Ukraine moment and the Ukraine context actually makes it crystal clear that Europe and the European Union are seen as the same thing, as the same entity for these purposes, right? I think there's absolutely no doubt that the people of Ukraine, not because they've all wished to join the European Union, they've maybe wished to be European in a particular way, but the circumstances and the power play now is such that they cannot imagine one without the other. So the two have actually become fused in the imagination, I think, at this particular point. I don't, I don't mean it'll necessarily stay like that, but I think that's the case. Now, I think that links to your, your point about, I think it's a really interesting point about, uh, maybe you want to make it again or develop it a bit more because it, it, you had to kind of hurry it at the end about the way in which the European political project could be understood in terms of sacrifice. I get the internal one, and that takes us back to yesterday's debate about whether uh, austerity is a form of sacrifice within the same framework as, you know, as, as, as what you were talking about. But the more interesting one, in a way, or maybe the one which is also part of it, is the external one, the idea. So maybe what you're saying there is that, so even, even, even something like strong conditionality at the point when the, uh, of, of the Central European accession could be seen with, through the prism of, of sacrifice. Yeah, okay. That uh, not just that you have to do certain things in order you know, to, to, to join us, but actually we can exclude you. We can, you know, you think of us as a party, right? Okay, we'll play your game. In that case, we can exclude you. You know, we can actually leave you out there, you know, you know <laughs> on the heath out with any position of control, et cetera, et cetera. We can do that, you know, so it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not just a kind of internal question about material wealth and that kind of, you know, sacrifice, sacrifice in terms of material well-being. It's actually, you know, do you want to be, you know, protected with us or do you not? So they're actually framing it in these sorts of terms. And of course that is, now the point is Europe seems to be very scared to actually say this because what's what's missing from that and why Paul can say Joe Biden could say that is because there's no there's no line at the end when it says so come and join us right there's no line that says that there's no other line that says okay fine you know you want to you want to stop being killed by the Russians come and join us you know that is not being said that is that's the, 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 the huge elephant in the room in this whole debate it's not it's not being said right and the gas keeps flowing. Yeah, I mean, we can think about all the reasons why it's not being said. I suspect if the gas wasn't flowing, they still wouldn't be saying it, right? Because in order to say that, they would actually then have to make a commitment to say, and we will raise arms in your defense, right? You know, so I don't think, I think the gas is a bit of a side issue here. It, it certainly helps them make it now, that allows them to make that kind of real politic argument. But I think it's a kind of self a side issue. Final point, just on utopia, because I'm doing a lot of work on utopia at the moment. And I think I like your way that you define uh, the project. You don't actually call it utopian, but I would call it precisely call it utopian, a project which is neither something which can simply be reduced to a kind of uh, theoretical possibility, which becomes a practical impossibility, or something that's realized. For me, utopia occupies the space between these two possibilities, right? But the point is, I think in these terms, it's very, very hard to look at any constitutional project which doesn't have a utopian dimension, 
right? You know, there might be interesting differences in the sort of utopian dimension of the European project to others, but I think it's very, very hard. I spent about a year looking at preambles. It's very hard <laughs> to look at any constitutional project which doesn't have that aspect. Even the post-fascist ones, even the post-communist ones, there is something within that. There's something aspirational. You know, Kozilek says, you know, modern time is utopian time. You know, it's, you know, the way in which we think about the projects and we're talking modernity always has a utopian dimension. So when people say that about the EU, I say, yeah, you're right. But in that sense, you know, that utopian sense of always becoming actually looks very, very familiar, I think, from our, from our, from our understanding of constitutional history and indeed the constitutional present. Mark, particularly appropriate. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> unhelpful observation. Paul asks, is the European Union moving to be a state? Who knows? But what bothers me is how the whole of the legal academy is in the game of building imaginative <laughs> esoteric, ingenious arguments to demonstrate that the EU is like a state. It's that a lot of you are engaged in an ideological exercise. I mean, there's no political reality in any of this. Uh, Paul's work is entirely on the construction of the most powerful nation state in the world today where Tony is the popular sovereign who creates the European Union. Where is the sacrifice, the, the real sacrifice born of the bloodiest civil war in history in the 1860s? You know, there, this is the parallel, they're, they're different worlds. Senior's going to object to that, but it, they're different worlds. And senior then, Ukraine, for oh, goodness sake, Ukraine is not fighting for Europe. Ukraine is fighting because they didn't have a choice. Russia invaded Ukraine. Ukraine had to defend itself or just be absorbed. It's not fighting for Europe. It's fighting for existence. Uh, this, we, we're given all the rhetoric from Zelensky and von der Leyen. It, I mean, it's hot air. It, I mean... Why are we accepting this rhetoric as though it's actually saying anything of political substance? And Neil touched on it when he said, well, yeah, but, but what follows? Nothing follows. To be an independent state, Ukraine has to be a member state. That is, it's no longer an independent state because member statehood is the relinquishment of a sovereign statehood. Bigelman's argument. And they see right. Uh, where are the where with respect to Ukraine is the real politique? It's it's we you know we, if we are talking about state building, empire building, nation building, then we should look at the literature. Look at what John Mearsheimer and these power politics he's talking about. He's saying. You, the Ukrainian crisis is as much, he actually says it's mainly the West's fault by dangling out to Ukraine, uh, NATO membership, EU membership. That was, it was only saying from a, from a power politics point of view, it's like he poking the bear. And if he will poke the bear, the bear is going to respond. And that's the reality. And we are buying into this message that somehow Putin is this mad imperialist dictator who is trying to overrun Europe. This is a Soviet Union, I'm sorry, so Russia. <laughs> Russia has a GDP less than Italy, for God's sake. It, it's just trying, it's not, it's not engaged in some restoration of the of the old Soviet Union. It's just trying to preserve its existence. And the, U, the US, I mean, the parallel that, uh, that Mearsheimer draws is the Monroe Doctrine. 
Just tried to bomb the old Soviet Union. Yeah, no, no, we <laughs> China enters into a military pact with Mexico. You think the United States are going to sit around and say, that's fine. It's, you know, the, the, the parallels are sort of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 62. No, no, it's, it's, it's just trying to preserve its, its own identity. And the tragedy is that the West is not innocent in this tragic situation that's now happening in Ukraine. But, you know, and your uh, last point, your, your map was the ladder. Let's get into Europe. Well, that's actually what happened in 1980, after 1989. And it became the revolutionary moment where, for the first time in history, the victors left. Those who got there, who restored their independence in Eastern Europe and became independent sovereign states and then joined the European Union and then lost their independence, all the professionals moved west. And you had rampant depopulation of areas like Lithuania and Latvia and, and Poland. As they all moved, they, and who moved? The professional, well-educated elites who saw better opportunities in this European Union so they could ply their trade as lawyers, doctors, accountants in the West and yet a better lifestyle overnight at a cost of destroying the, the independent statehood that they just created. I mean, the, this Europe of the, this wonderful, I'll stop. Alex, <laughs> <laughs> and then you have this round of reactions and then we'll ask you questions. So thank you, Marco. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, so I, I'm a friend of the cultural study of Marx, I'm not an enemy, um, but I, I'm a concerned friend, uh, and I'm concerned about, I guess, a sort of occupational hazard of thick description uh, of the kind that's, that's encouraged by it. And I'm not saying that Paul's work is necessarily guilty of this. I'm not saying that anyone's work is necessarily guilty of this, but I think I, I worry about this, I have an anxiety about it. Because yes, we need to understand the sort of symbolic system of law, how it gives meaning, how it creates a worldview, et cetera, et cetera. But the danger I'm worried about is a tendency to end up conceiving people as sort of passive carriers or conduits of culture. Like we're just, you know, transmission lines of, of values and beliefs and concepts and principles and not actively also ourselves cultural innovators. So shaping bending ideas, concepts, and values for particular goals and purposes. I mean, this is the sort of thing that you were alluding to with John Marshall, I think. So, um, so I don't think that you commit this sin that I'm talking about, but I worry about the, the way that your work and maybe other types of work like this might influence people to, to ignore agency and innovation. Uh, and I think, I think a cultural study of law needs probably to be uh, coupled with a theory of cultural change or cultural innovation some kind. Uh, so when we look at these sorts of examples like judicial supremacy in the United States, um, that didn't just emerge organically as an idea. I mean, that were, there were people, there were particular chief justices that, that, that created this, that, that bent existing resources to their purposes to create that. There were particular presidents that decided not to curb the courts because it was seen as potentially too costly or not worth their while. Um, and so th this is something that emerges like through conflict and agency and, and purposive uh, behavior. And I mean, the same goes, I think, for parliamentary sovereignty in the UK. It's not a per principle that just emerges out of nothing. Um, and this, these ideas of the EU, this is, this is you know, and the, and the ECJ's interventions, these are not just sort of, these aren't people just sort of oracles kind of transmitting beliefs and values, they're, they're trying to shape understandings of these ideas and principles. They're, they're, they're engaged in, 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 in an action, um, not just a kind of, uh, and this is a great example. So these sort of speeches in, in, in the EU parliament aren't just expressions of pre-existing ideas and values. They're actively trying to shape 
values and beliefs about what Europe means, about what the EU means. So this, so we, these are these are things I think that get lost or perhaps a little bit neglected when we when we focus on the description as if the values, beliefs, the narratives, the myths are already all there, and people are simply just expressing them. Uh, rather than actually changing them, tweaking them, bending them, breaking them, uh, suppressing them, or elevating some over others. So I, I worry that without a more attention to cultural innovation, let's call it, that, the, that we end up kind of just going around in a circle of, of, of description without explaining the, uh, the changes that we see. So it's a worry. Let's take the first reaction, because I'm mindful. Well, I say already over time. Well, we're not yes. just saying, but we are closer. Well, I, I would react to this. For... Yeah, but first, let's ask the speaker. I, I think there are so many things said, so I'm not not sure where to start. I think not necessarily. Uh, I don't know whether I've had anything constructive to say. <laughs> <laughs> so let's so, take then another quick. You're well, I'll let you react to the end of the of, um, of the mm. session. So uh, let's take our uh, three questions. We have Amalia, Maria, and so. Well, I, I like um, uh, your uh, well, the way in which you um, break a little bit or argue that there's a broad distinction that is not a very sharp one between revolutionary politics and the rule of law and that in fact it, it is much more connected than just separate and uh, self-contained departments, so to speak. And I like to, to, to uh, contribute to that uh, by questioning as well that uh, revolutionary politics has to be alternative to that uh, is a uh, rule of law and that uh, in law there, there is no other way so that there are no revolutions in law so it's either we're in the rule of law or we're in revolutionary politics whereas in fact in the life of the law i think there are revolutions and this is another way in which this distinction between um uh, revolutionary politics and the, rule, and the rule of law um can be also undermined there are revolutions, but these are not the type of revolutions that we might be. It's not the, it's not the French Revolution, or and it is not the type of scientific revolutions by replacement like Union revolutions. It's a different type of revolution. Those in law are more revolutions like by emplacement rather than by uh, displacement or replacement. So it's a type of gradual revolution that happens in other domains as well, like in science, not the Kunian type, but in other, which is more appropriately applied physics or geology, but to other types of sciences like uh, computing, for instance, uh, or chemistry. Uh, and I think that uh, if we focus on the idea of revolution all in this Kunian way, or only in this uh, highly political way, which is a drastic change, it replaces one order and by another. And then with the law, once we establish that order, there is no space for revolution. We are missing a lot in terms of how in fact, we can undertake revolutionary changes while remaining within the same framework. And this connects with the cultural change uh, that you just mentioned. Um, I, 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 I love that you brought that up because I, I have a similar worry with the cultural analysis of law. And if we just describe those beliefs about the law as if they are there, and we, then we, we lack the tools to actually give an account of the way in which they evolve. And it's not merely that we are kind of passive, uh, we are simply passively um, carrying on different beliefs, but rather we contribute to shaping those beliefs, sometimes in revolutionary ways, sometimes even breaking <laughs> with previous beliefs. Uh, and I think uh, that, in fact, that there are interesting views dependent in, um, in cultural evolution about how this happens. Um, this cycle of uh, imitating others which is not simply reproducing, but actually reenacting the way you put it. I, I love it, like reenacting, reinterpreting. So it's not merely passively uh, continuing uh, or, or being uh, passing um, beliefs from one generation to the next, but reshaping them in various ways. And this is paired up with moments of innovation that require, in fact, imitation as the, as the bedrock upon which innovation can actually happen. So it's a much more dynamic approach, I think, to uh, how the law evolves uh, than we might be able to do as we stay just at the level of, of describing the beliefs about the, the law. Thank you. Um, maybe like half a second on Ukraine. I, I think there's 
I mean, I like a lot of the things that you're saying, but I think there's something different about this in that it's the first war that's being conducted on Zoom, and you have Zelensky in all of these parliaments all around the world. This is rhetoric maybe matters more than power in a context where rhetoric is driving a lot of the conversation that we're having. Um, and at least on the ground in court, people are responding very much um, with their opening their houses, opening their, you know, to the to the rhetoric. But I wanted to ponder for a moment the idea of sacrifice and Paul has given us this, this concept and I've been listening and I'm not sure I've I've picked up on all the intimations in all of the presentations because I, it's, I've been formulating sort of my own ideas as I've been going along, but I think we're struggling to integrate this, this word and this concept into our analysis. And maybe that says something about the European Union, or maybe it says something about sacrifice. Um, so, I mean, as you break it, as I break it down, there's, there's something about sacrifice that goes to identity and there's something about it that goes to action. Um, so within the um, action realm, um, there are sort of lesser intimations of sacrifice, which are maybe renunciation, which is the word you have used, giving up something for the sake of something better or something more important, um, surrender, letting go of something for the sake of something more important, foregoing, not taking something for the sake of something more important, and responsibility, doing something, taking on something for the sake of more important. So all of those things, maybe we could more maybe might be words that we'd be more comfortable <laughs> handling in the context of, um, of our situations than the word sacrifice. And on the identity side, then um, there's, there's a kind of transformation element which has been used um, by both of you, I think, where you change for the sake of more, something more important. And then there's a, a victimhood sense where um, either voluntarily or imposed on you, there's a, a powerlessness, a disempowerment that comes for the sake of something more important. But, but I think none of those things get to the point of sacrifice in its truest sense, where it's just destruction of something for the sake of something more important, or destruction of someone for the sake of someone more important. And that's the bit that, that, we're, that we're not able to handle, I think. Um, and maybe that's because um, maybe that's because of the times we're living in, maybe that's because of the way that we think about the world. But, but one of the things that I think we haven't discussed, I'm not sure, and um, it's definitely not there um, in Sina's work because all of these different modes of constitutionalism that you identify that I think are very illuminating, illuminating ground EU constitutionalism in the existing state constitutionalism in a nice way. Um, and when, when Tony, when you were talking about collective transformation, the idea there is the member states come together. So what, what the EU doesn't ask is that the member states' constitutions be sacrificed. It's not saying, and it's saying exactly the opposite. You don't have to sacrifice your member state. You don't have to sacrifice your constitution. You don't have to sacrifice your sovereignty. You can have all of this as well as everything you currently have. It's an anti-sacrifice movement, actually, I think. Um, so that's, a, that's where I'm up to. Positive sovereignty. Yeah, I want to say a couple words about the rhetoric of Wonderland because it, it really deeply scares me. I, I, I think it might have an effect that is completely against what it intends to, to do. And I just want to say a couple of words because I think your presentation was super nice. It hinted at a lot of, I, I think I lost my voice at dinner. <laughs> so I think it hinted at a lot of um, questions of identity in the European Union. And I mean, you have these three, I'm going to simplify, three big schools of thought. You know, some say there will never be a European Union identity. People can only identify with their own thick national cultures, one side. Then you have the other side, and they are extremely loud in the legal scholarship, and they're extremely loud in the EU institutions that are saying EU law is supposed to help people to emancipate themselves from their thick national identities and create a new cosmopolitan uh, identity. You know, it's, and it's a question of emancipation. And again, they're very loud in legal scholarship. They're very loud in the institutions, the, the, the schools. And then, then you have this in-between school that are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't create a new cosmopolitan identity that replaces the national one because 
the European identity is exactly supposed to be a thin one that's supposed to control the corruptive tendencies of the member state identity. Sure. Typical wider argument. Huh? Yes. Thank you. Now, when the, for a long time before the whole Russian conflict started, I think there was a lot of talk about what would help Europe, and this was especially the second school, what would help Europe to create this identity and ethos? So we just need a common enemy. And then suddenly we will get, we get together. And now we have a common, common enemy. And I think what they do is exploit exactly the common enemy and try to now create this, this um, ethos, this cosmopolitan ethos for Europe that they want to create. But for me, it's so, I mean, it's so far off reality. It's so far away from what people on the ground believe and think. I, uh, I even think that they perceive the Russian threat as a threat to their member state identities. I don't think any a European citizen actually thinks about this is a threat to the European Union. I, I think the, the ones that are fond of this project in the institutions, this, this really small elite, they, they believe this is a threat for the European Union, but I'm not sure people on the ground believe it. And here I come just from where I started. My, my, my fear a little bit with this rhetoric is that if you citizens read in the first place, I don't know if they will read in the first place, but if they do, yeah. it will even antagonize them more uh, from, from the European Union. So, yeah, this is just a word of skepticism because it's. Um, yeah. But what I do here is analytical. I'm saying there's a new discourse here. And we should think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and try to understand yeah. it. I'm not like. I'm not out here like playing. No, no, I didn't, like, I didn't really like it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Anyway, I'm trying to understand where the conflict is going mm -hmm. and, and the dynamics. Mm -hmm. And there, I think about the two levels, my point would be, and, and this is what I do in my book as well, to say, well, if you have federations, federal unions, there's always sort of a building of identity and governmental capacity at two levels at the same time. Mm -hmm. And there's always a force that that's this um, central petal and one that is centrifugal. And in, in this, you can always go towards the states or the union and pull the project in either direction. Mm -hmm. And in order for, for a union to be stable, you need to find a way of balance. Because this is also what you're getting at. Mm -hmm. You need to find some kind of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And one way of trying to do that is through identity and through saying, if you can necessarily, the, the member states will have to give up power authority yeah, to be a part of the project. But if they can conceive of that as a way of realizing themselves, then that sacrifice might not seem like a problem. So I think the ingenious argument for in, in the US context was that republicanism required the individual states to give up on their sovereignty to realize a republican project. And I think a structurally similar thing is going on in the post fascist project, but that they're saying to realize our constitution, we have to limit sovereign power because sovereignty is dangerous. And we do that through Europe. Yeah? So there's a way of doing that. But clearly, that doesn't work for the evolutionary, right? There's no way you can say limiting sovereign power can realize evolutionary constitutions. It's just a conflict, right? There's, there's no way of dealing with it. Right? And the so you... fascist states don't seem to accept it either today. Some of the post communists don't seem to accept it either. So no, I mean, that tension is not, not, it's it's not like a magic bullet, but I'm saying, okay, there are logics here where you can yeah. think about no. ways of like a language of like thinking about med med mediation. Yeah? But yeah. For, for, for the UK and Scandinavia, yeah. this is no way. I mean, you have to come up with these like new concepts, right? In the UK, constitutional yeah. statutes, yeah. right? To so say, oh, like, we have a problem here. So, you know, lawyers are always ingenious. So we create this new conceptual universe to try to make sense that the system remains stable, but it doesn't make any sense. I mean, really, this is a way of sort of uh, mediating a conflict, not a way of resolving it. But your point of the post communist states is it's flipped over there. Yeah, it was a bit resolving, but now yeah. so <laughs> the solution that's, that's has become the problem. There, right? yeah. And I didn't go into that the presentation. Yeah. There's also, there's always a fear, and that was a quite from the beginning, of Europe becoming a new empire. Yeah, new yeah. empire. So it's sort of a way of like, Realizing themselves, but there's always this fear right, that that it will be, you know, an, an for them. So there's also a conflict. So I'm, I'm not saying like, oh, this is beautiful world where there are no tensions, and then it's but showing and say, okay, these conflicts because there will always be conflicts between the two levels. That's 
Yeah, but there, was an, there was an attempt in 2005 to create something in the United States of Europe. There was an attempt, it failed. So that's an important point, an important moment that didn't happen in the US. Okay, that, that's a whole like debate about this. I'm not going to go into it because then we'll be there uh, for a very long time. Um, I guess, I mean, uh, there's a few more comments, but I guess. I mean, I'm thinking about what, what your discussion here and about uh, what, what these words tell us, but I would say, however, maybe there's some skepticism in that uh, what I find is also characteristic of EU law for a long time is a certain always like mismatch between words and reality in the sense that, you know, I, Ulrich Halter, he says, you know, the European constitution you know, they promised us a constitution and they gave us a cheap, uh, cheap phone, phone charger or things like this. You know, that there's, that, that ultimately what would characterize the European project is this kind of bathos effect of, you know, we want freedom and, uh, and, and cheap, uh, cheap. Uh, Cam phone. Camper shoes, Europe yeah. as camper. Yeah. What? Camper. camper shoes, that was his first argument. Europe as camper. But this, I mean, so, so, so so that, I'm just saying that, yeah. it, I think you can, you know, uh, it's, it's true that, you know, the words that uh, Van der Leyen are, are using are, are, are those, you know, that, that, that Biden can use, but, you know, it's also that the fact that we've been talking about the European constitution forever. And, uh, but, but that's exactly why I also analyze, you know, the member states, right? That I'm not only looking at the European level and my, you know, when I talk to other EU lawyers, I say, you know, like, why is it the only look at the Court of Justice? Why is that like the only yeah. interesting thing to look at? It doesn't make any sense. Like, if you accept that the union is a composite policy, why are you only looking at one aspect of it? And like, okay, I would also say, why are you only look at the court? I mean, to me, that doesn't make any sense at all. You have to look at the Commission, the European Central Bank, all the other agencies as well to show up really like very important to look at the bank right now. Okay. Um, but, but also you have to look at the member states. It doesn't make any sense. Right. The thing about you know not understanding those political orders as well and how they interact. Um, one, can I, one can I, last? Oh, okay. I I just have a short question in response to all of this. Again, from from the American point of view, um, which I would represent for Democrats, I suppose. <laughs> um, from my point of view, uh, I'm I'm struck by how short the time frame is of memory that is uh, informing this conversation. Because from my point of view, you can talk about uh, evolutionary constitutionalism and, and, and the UK or, or the problems of France, but, but of course, from, from my point of view, the European Union is a response to the First and Second World Wars. Uh, and um, the, the UK has a huge stake uh, in a peaceful Europe. Uh, uh, and, uh, as, as, as so there's like a complete disappearance uh, in this conversation of everything before, I don't know if it's 2005 or 1989 or whatever. Um, so I, I wonder uh, uh, about the time frame within which, you know, what's the political memory here? Um, I think World War II looms very large and, um, and the interwar period. I think what is missing, and that would be my point for, for the project I'm undertaking right now, is that empire is missing. But people don't get that in many ways what the European Union is, is what my argument would say, this is a successor and eventual alternative to empire. And that's just not us. You know, it's a story about uh, national excess. That's the way the story is told. There was national excess, you know, too much democracy. Then we had a big war. That was bad. And then, you know, we united. Uh, and that was good. That's sort of like the orthodox story. I would say. Yeah. yeah, but that's the German story is the one that informs the project. Yeah. I think also but Paul's point though the I mean there was all these the road not taken, the failure of the European defense project, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There was no early institutional common memory that that's what the European Union was about. Yeah. You got it a little bit with Benelux and the other three member states, but it was never why the UK joined. It wasn't any of that around enlargements. It was no part of the narrative of the enjoyment. Even though you're right, it is a massive part of the history and people do bring it up from time to time, but it lacks that common institution in the, yeah. in the early It's memory. also a, a story that, you know, the European Union from the, 
from the center, they want to, to tell a story of success. So they don't tell us about, you know, the projects that fail. So they don't tell the story that, you know, just in the years leading up to the seminal judgment, right? Panama laws and Costa versus Enol. There was a project to create a European military federation that almost passed yeah. just the years before. Hmm. And that, you know, the whole way of thinking was shaped by that. And no, you know, it's sort of like, oh, and this judgment came out of nothing That's right. from the minds of the judges, right? Without at, at all recognizing the underlying political context of this. Because it's it's absurd to think that you know you can create a powerful thing like the European Union by by, by a few judges sitting in Luxembourg. That's just absurd, right? The political foundations uh, are, are somewhat else, and I would say very much in the member states. Um, so now I, I'm branding with like my, my own. I need to read you quickly and then we'll wrap it up because we're pretty late. Miguel asked the best, how does you see the links between the current narrative of Europe's strategic autonomy and, her, and your concept of European sovereignty? Elaborate on this in 45 seconds. <laughs> yeah, no, but they're part of the same discourse, I would say, right? I mean, and they are openly tied together. That I mean, uh, European sovereignty is, is is claiming European strategic autonomy in a geopolitical sense. This is this is what you know. If you look at um, State of the Union 2018, this is what they're saying. Um, so they they clearly just into things. So I don't know what is a more to the know. question. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I would love to have a conversation about this. Yeah, but... yeah. I think Miguel is not here right now. Okay, so now he is actually like... at the doctor's appointment. So okay, so then it's even more serious. Send a question. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, okay, good. So let's have a quick break. Uh, thanks a lot for this fantastic discussion. I would say seven minutes. Mm -hmm. Break. Um, all the the coffee the yeah, 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 yeah. No, the 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 yeah, yeah. No, I don't see there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, So where is the coffee, right? Yeah, so yeah. Oh, 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 Recently, yes. yeah. right. okay. so, we, we have a number of these uh, groups, like criminal. We have a legal and political theory forum. We have a criminal law. We have a private law. We have a yeah. group organized in various seminars. But I don't think that I don't think that so, yeah. 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 Our campus has been transformed in the last couple of years. Really much. It's all possible all over now, uh, but it's all been disrupted. But uh, we Some had been, we had very. Regular seminars, yeah, but the last actually. two years of just I know that it's, yeah, it's made it difficult, I think, yeah, because so um, I don't think we've got back into the history. No and the, and the thing is, I'm not sure we will. Yeah, I think some well people have gotten used to working time. from home, yeah, just coming yeah, in to yeah, do whatever they need to do. It might well be I think it can and then, we will not. It's not the state. Yeah. Yeah. We cannot yeah. like go back to what it was as nothing ever happened. Um, yeah. Somehow, but I, yeah, yeah. But I mean, this is, this uh, is not, not again like later <laughs> term. I would mean something positive. No, it can be a negative. Yeah, I push myself here to. So I work as a writer. A little unfortunate, I think. Yeah, so this is. I don't even use social media. Yeah, what I've talked about is how the conversation is very analytical. Yeah, I think it's in the show. But, but yeah, I mean, we have the, 
Yeah. Since last term, we just started. Well, it was yeah. second then, yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it's okay, a, but no, I mean, Dennis is on the list, is going for us to. Yeah. And was it hybrid so that people could zoom uh, in? No, it wasn't. Ah, okay. Because that's what we often have. Uh, yeah, he, like he that. thought that the, that village school wanted to have like this type of oh, yes. event only uh, no, it's, it's, to it's, it's, encourage it's, it's, attendance. Yeah. So. I, I, because zoom is um, well, ambivalent, hand. really, because on the one hand, it enabled, I, I've discovered this term, for example. But, it has enabled me so, to uh, zoom in to seminars. So well, yes, but, the, um, but on the other hand, it makes it easier oh, for me. Okay, I'll make a good idea. Not to go exactly. And then for the speaker, it's. I think it's. This is for what time? Well, I'm glad you say that because I no, I just think no, no, I, I, I think it's actually very bad for like his interview. I wasn't saying that. I'm just trying to make it all that, and I just present to the so you know, I like I like presenting valid questions, but I don't try to involve safety time, you know, fire time, appropriate time, all the kind of issues. It's the essence of the development. Uh, it's part of the kind of project. Yeah. Open well, design. I don't know. You, know, you, know, you can't think. I mean, there are a lot of stuff that comes from it. I'm sorry, on, on, uh, uh, on uh, <laughs> the origins <laughs> of the this link to the origin of the Alongside, you know, uh, 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 uh
But you can. Oh, it seems you, uh, it seems you, you had a reply to that. <laughs> yeah. Do you yeah. talk in energy? I think maybe we'll get into it at, at the end. It's a very well within it. Right. Complete misrepresentation. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, I mean, well, you know, I'm doing a lot of work that are on climate, climate crisis <laughs> and um, what I call the one shot yeah. utopia. Fair enough. The yeah. Yeah. There, you yeah. yeah. thought you yeah. thought yeah. far more central and also yeah. far more yeah. resisting. Yeah. Like, you know, but, uh, yeah. I don't think it's static at all, but yeah. but the question is, you know, how does it actually relate to freedom and action? So that, those are serious questions. Yeah, I have an essay in the latest evolution of the law. Well, I, I, I think the political theology book is a book that oh, yeah, answers this question in some way. It's a book about, it's a book about freedom. It's about what's the nature of freedom. You know, laws. And so, but there's, so there's two sides, you know, what's, what's the nature of, of yeah, I think how, how do we actually like, provide a kind of phenomenology to that freedom, how do we understand the legal what it is to take freedom, yeah. and second, um, what is it that cultural study purports to do? Yeah, yeah. Are, 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 are these constraints yeah. Yeah. in some way? Is that even the right way to think about it? I disagree with that idea. So it's like saying, um, you know, if, if, if we study language, um, you know, we're, we're actually studying a yeah. domain yeah. of constraint. Yeah. Whereas I would say, no, no, when you yeah. study language, you're yeah. studying yeah. how it's possible to be free. Yeah. Uh, in, yeah. Fact, yeah. Yeah, the fact that you have to conjugate your verbs doesn't mean that you're not free. Yeah. <laughs> people, people innovate language all the time, which is why well, that changes. Right. But people, <laughs> people pursue their innovation so within that. language. So it's, it's put to use. Uh, Set um, by Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with yeah, that. It's, it's a domain of action, but it's also the of action. Like, you have to be careful about the yeah. oppositions you set up. Okay. And what kind of a constraint? Is it symbolic constraint? Yeah, yeah. Or it's a rather the creation of an opportunity for possibilities. Something with which one engages in, in a free act. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Constraint. No one dies. Yeah, yeah. So we have yeah. to be careful about thinking about what are the conditions of <laughs> freedom. How do we actually? Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is another yeah. Scottish delicacy. Sacrifice. No, no sacrifices were made. <laughs> we need a dead people. Yeah, we need a dead people. Without dead people, we're not going to be in the You have to have a tonic. Even without the tonic. <laughs> no, the celebration of the yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So, okay. Okay, guys. Okay. We're, 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 we're running a little behind, so we should get started. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, right. This is the last <laughs> Santa panel before the uh, before the final round table. And we have, uh, well, we don't quite have Dennis here, but <laughs> we have Dennis Baron J from Paris, uh, and then followed by Or Adolf uh, from Nottingham. Two, two uh, papers on the system and project dimension of, uh, of Paul's work. So, hello, Dennis. How are you doing? Hi. <laughs> Very good to see you all. My apologies for uh, not being present in person. So to quote from the late François Mitterrand, I'll be with you by the spirit. <laughs> you okay, so we, we, can, we can hear from you from between 20 and 25 minutes. That's and, great. Yeah, stop yeah. me when I'm... Uh, That's <clears throat> in front of the screen. <laughs> when you're right yeah. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. I'm going to start. Uh, <clears throat> right. So... Um, my, my approach to constitutional law is as a mode of ordering human affairs in, in the context of modernity. I see it as one of modernity's core answers to the problem of what John Locke called a well-ordered government. In this regard, Paul Kant's work deserves our attention. He takes seriously the, quote, imaginary project, unquote, at play in the law. Unlike many contemporary lawyers, Paul is not afraid of institutions and concepts, as well as conceptual construct. 
There's a lot to be found in his work in order to build a theory of, of order. In this paper, I will draw on this rich material as well as discuss it. So I thought easier to give you my main argument as, as a slide. So this is slide number one that you have here, I think, before you. That's the main argument that was also in, in, uh, in my abstract. My, my first part will be devoted to an, an, interpret an interpretation, sorry, of political theology. I'm sorry I missed yesterday's conversation and I hope I won't be redundant. <clears throat> I, I'm not a philosopher and even less a theology. Yet, as a lawyer, I think it's useful to understand the meaning of political theology. It has an impact on law understood as a, a cultural phenomenon. The effect of Schmidt's main statement in his book, Political Theology, uh, the, though the effects on public law thinking since it has appeared as sufficient evidence of this, I think. And so uh, is Paul's intervention in the debate on his own book, Political Theology. Really, my point is fairly simple and maybe too blunt, too, too abrupt. Political theology is not theology. <laughs> uh, this is, of course, very abrupt. Political theology is a project within which there are some religious references and some theology involved. Yet, at the whole, the name on the plate, the denomination should not be theology. I think political theology is pointing in another direction. In fact, there is very little theology in Schmidt's first book, Political Theology of 1922. What there is in the book, in this first part, is a set of metaphysical positions about history, institutions, and the law, as well as an insistence on the role of ideology. In the second part of the Political Theology in 1969, Schmidt also says, quote, my political theology has nothing to do with a theological dogma, as it is a problem regarding the theory of legal science on history of ideas, end quote. On, in, in the book, after a flurry of references to theology in the beginning of, uh, of Schmidt's political theology, and even more so in the, in the preface to the to number two, 1969, I, I would beg to say that theology proper takes a leave of absence. Uh, what Schmidt has to offer is in fact a metaphysics of law, and even more precisely, a, a legal ontology that brings together the existence of law on the nature of um, uh, politics as a phenomenon. I am aware that uh, the use I will make of the word ontology would appear as very loose to, to, to a professional philosopher, if not faulty. By ontology, I will mean a philosophical investigation into modes of being, lato sense. Right, so um, this is not to say that theology is entirely absent, but it operates in the background, both in Schmidt and in Paul's work. This is reminiscent of something Heidegger had said at the beginning of one of his lectures, quote, we will honor theology by remaining silent about it, unquote. This silence about what matters most is in fact a tribute to the way in which, according to Schmidt, the divine operates in human politics. Decision, for instance, is an irrational, but fundamentally adequate, fundamentally correct apprehension of what uh, political existence requires. Uh, it is to politics what miracles are to religion. Miracles operate beyond the realm of causes and effects. Thus, they are not properly, so to speak, no wibbles, except by their results, by what they do, and also by their name, their being miracles. How then could we characterize Paul's relationship to, to, to theology? I may be wrong here, but and I will ask Paul the question, but it seems to me that his intervention moves towards what I would call a, de, a further de-theologizing of political theology. In Khan, religion is there certainly, but as quote, that's from Cultural Study of Law, page 42, quote, a religious resonance, end quote. In so doing, Khan undertakes a genealogy of our existence, of our, sorry, of our own experience. However modern we can claim to be, we don't know how we think, and neither do we know how we make our own law. This is a limit to our autonomy and a limit to our self-government, to our ability to self-order and self-govern ourselves. Our own legal and political concepts, political theology tells us, are not what they appear to be. There are theological concepts transferred from the theological sphere into the state on, on public law. So that would be uh, my um, slide number two, Marco, if I may. I'd like to make three points here very briefly. Uh, if political theology is not theology, then what? 
well, three points. First, it's theologized politics. I reverse the terms, not political theology anymore, but theologized the science of politics. Second, it's philosophical anthropology. I'm not the first one to say that about Paul, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to repeat the others. <laughs> On third, I would say it's a moment in the history of metaphysics. Uh, uh, first, then, political theology is in fact the name, I think, that's given to something that, that's the reverse of what it says uh, on, on, uh, on, on the plate. It's, it's theologized politics. And then, at the risk of um, stating an oxymoron, of contradicting myself, but I accept that risk, <clears throat> I would say that political theology is a theologized politics in the context of an exiting from religion. It's um, the, the rest, the remnants of theology that are available to us now that we have left um, religion. And I'm thinking here of, of Marcel Gauchet, la sortie de la religion, the exiting, the outing from religion. Uh, what Paul calls the remnants, I quote him, the remnants of theological influences <clears throat> that can be thus uncovered by political theology, do not reside, and this is me who's speaking here, do not reside in their original setting, their original ecosystem, if I may say so, anymore. We have moved in Weberian terms from a traditionalistic social order towards a legal rational one, and this makes a big difference, obviously. Our worldview is not religious anymore. Even for those of us who consider themselves as deeply religious, um, when religious views are strongly held in our cultural legal world, they are not necessarily able to prevail. And here in the paper, I'm quoting, I, I'm, I'm thinking of the French debate on gay marriage. In France, the religious conservatives <clears throat> have fought gay marriage with an argument drawn from Catholic natural law. This was a serious argument with a very respectable intellectual pedigree, yet the claim has ceased to be audible and the argument hasn't worked. Second, if this is not theology, maybe this is philosophical anthropology. Uh, it would seem to me that what it does, and especially what Paul does, other than Schmidt, is to carve out an anthropologi uh, sorry, anthropological and existential definition of, of politics. Um, I would venture to say that um, in, in Kant's own words, uh, what he provides us is, quote, a thick anthropological description, thick anthropological description of the law. Uh, what would appear at first sight as theological concepts really matters as guides to understanding the meaning of being human, uh, of living a human existence in, in, in society, in a political community. Sacrifice, for instance, matters insofar as it is a human behavior. So does martyrdom, for instance. Um, um, I'm not sure the gods are interested in the sacred. In a world that would be made for gods, one does not need to distinguish the godly from the ungodly, the sacred from the profane. Only man, men's world needs those demarcation. Only men, for instance, appear to be capable of blasphemy. And I, I, I will discuss in the paper uh, Paul's uh, attitude to civic religion. I, I've always had a problem with, uh, with civic religion because to me, it's not religion. It's a form of political experience. It's a sacralization of the profane. It is politics baptizing, christening itself. Right, so I would say that Paul contributes to what Eric Fögelin has called the understanding of man, quote, meaningful concreteness, meaningful concreteness, which in Fögelin's view, was a condition for restoring a genuine political science. Thirdly, I would say that uh, actually political theology is a moment in the history of metaphysics. Um, I would say that um, Paul's philosophical anthropology is a philosophy of existence. It aims at unraveling and reweaving the threads that unite human existence and politics as the field, as the realm of human affairs. His political theology aims at addressing the problem of how the fundamental conditions of our um, existence play a role in politics on the law. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to elaborate, but I think it makes a big difference with Schmidt's political uh, theology. I'm, I'm really going to skip uh, this part of my argument um, because of lack of time, but it, I think I would say that Paul's laudable purpose is to remind us that there is more to politics than the surface of our institutional practices on the norms 
that are put into use to help them operate. There is a deeper view of politics as being concerned with man's very presence on earth on the essential values that underpin it. On all this, uh, I'll be quick again, all this points to metaphysics. And this is slide number three, please mark off. The next one, please. Right, that's a, that's a quote from Steiner with just with the, um, the, the literary critic, which, which just points to what I want to do. Metaphysics here means something that can be perfectly mundane, perfectly a part of an immanent world. It's just an ordering of the transcendent on the imminent, an ordering of our imagination uh, as a relationship between something that is upper and something which is lower. And this is what Schmidt does, and this is also what Paul does. Uh, uh, Schmidt says it very clearly. He says that he makes little effort to hide that his appeal to theology is very close to metaphysics. Uh, I'm not going to quote him, but uh, that, um, many, many references to that in, in, in his book. And when so, some uh, theologians in, in, in Germany have criticized him, uh, Eric Peterson, for instance, of, of Feiner, they said that, they said it's not theology in, in, in the first place, basically it's metaphysics. So Schmidt's uh, metaphysics was a project to restore fundamental metaphysical truths. Uh, I'm not sure this is what Paul does. I, I think actually Paul does the reverse, but then again, I'm, I'm, I'd like to ask him the question because um, I'm not really sure about that. I don't know where Paul stands in this regard. Uh, um, he speaks about metaphysical structures. Of, uh, he speaks about institutionalized metaphysics. But Paul, did you give a thought? That's a question for later, obviously. Did you give a thought to that question of political theology on the history of metaphysics? Because I don't see you as someone, uh, as a conservative in, in the Schmitt, uh, Schmitt yeah, um, type who wants to restore something from the past to show modernity that it's actually a failure. I don't think you want to do that. But if you don't, uh, where do you stand? Uh, if you do not share the view that traditional metaphysics can be reinstated, that you can actually um, go beyond the deconstruction of metaphysics. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you're a conservative in this regard, certainly unlike Schmidt. Uh, what is then the foundation of your own brand, of your own variety of political uh, uh, theology? So then I move to my next slide. Um, uh, no, actually, no. Um, can you show me? The previous one. No, maybe maybe I didn't put the slide at all. No, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm not going to elaborate on this, but I will finish my first part in the paper by three questions about political theology because I have some. Um, I'm not certain about that. First, when people talk about political theology, is this not indeed canon law? Is this not in the ecclesiology, uh, Christian discipline, or apologetic? I see Schmidt as. Uh, an, an apologist, someone who does apologetics rather than that, rather than um, theology. Second, how do you select the transferred concept? Uh, uh, can you do it at random? Can't you have to transfer them all in a wholesale fashion? And I'm going to skip point three because it's it's too long, but I'm, I'm, I'm um, happy to deal with it uh, later. As a rule of thumb, I'm not sure I'm entirely convinced by some of the parallels that Paul draws between biblical politics or early European politics on our modern setting. I don't quite see, I mean, respectfully, I don't quite see the connection between face healing, for instance, by ancient regime kings on the modern prerogative of pardon that Paul does. The parallel doesn't strike me as, as very conclusive. I'm not quite certain I see the way in which nuclear deterrence is a modern remnant of the king's mystical body. I'm not quite certain either that the confirmation hearing in America, um, in, in, in this hearing, a citizen is turned magically into a Supreme Court justice by, quote, engaging into a public turning away from his previous self, unquote. This is from Paul. Um, um, anyway, for instance, take Brett Kavanaugh, for instance. Did Kavanaugh purge himself from his vices or failings during his hearings? Did he not actually make them visible to the whole world? thus showing how little Supreme Court's lawyers were the moral superiors of ordinary citizens. Uh, didn't the right fail? Didn't the religious attempt to have a, a, a ritual here collapse? Or maybe did, did not American civic religion collapse at, at the same time? I now switch to my part two, which is gonna be shorter. Uh, it's about project and system. 
like I said at the outset, I think that there are two um, so-called theories of order in Paul's work. Uh, the second one is has begun in Origins of Order, uh, and it's what I call the project and system program, research program. And uh, I, there is a quote um, from Paul in, in, in this slide. I'm not going to repeat it, but Paul says very convincingly, very persuasively, that there's been a shift between project to system. And, and to quote from him, from thinking of law as the product of a project to thinking of law as, quote, an immanent system. It's immanent. It's not transcendent anymore. To quote Fugelin, I would say that, yes, it's immanent, but it's illuminated from within. So I would say there is a kind of transcendence, which is a part of uh, our imaginary imminent. <laughs> um, I would submit that on that C, no, you can keep that slide. I would submit that origins of order read as a foray into the deeper ontological categories structuring the imaginary institution of American society. Project and system are key words for a larger set of ontological categories enabling us, enabling historical actors to ascribe the qualities of transcendence versus imminence, presence versus absence, reality versus unreality, energy versus lack of energy, weakness, order versus chaos to various objects or entity, the people, uh, the state, the law itself, and so on. This is, these ascriptions have shifted over time, and this is what Paul says, from the founder's ontology of, on, here I, I, I quote admiringly Paul, quote, violence to text on text to order, text to order, unquote. I think this is one of the most remarkable statements in Origins of Order. The founding uh, father's idea that actually there was a move from revolution to the constitution, and then from the constitution to a systematic ordering of constitutional law. I think that's quite remarkable. <clears throat> and then there's been the 19th century reliance on law science, on the social, which, uh, which is uh, moving away from this kind of, of, of ordering. So political theology and project and system are both key parts of our institutional imaginary of order. On my concern, which I'm not, not sure I really can elaborate, it's really something that's trying to mind. My concern is whether those two approaches uh, are co just compatible. Uh, what I would say, is that origins of order arises out of the observation that political theology has been buried at an even deeper layer of visibility by secularization. Our tradition as it now stands is massively secularized despite the, despite the return, the cultural return of religion in, in the last decades. Its ordering concepts are not visibly theological, uh, um, but something else is needed that chimes with the secularized world into which we live. And this might, might be what, what the, the answer or the solution that Paul has provided in Origins of Order. This, might, this may be what the project and system couple of concepts stands for. It helps us grasp how to envisage a well-ordered government or maybe several well-ordered subsystems like politics and, and the law. This is by using this toolbox of ontological categories that constitutional law in particular generates a, say, a sense of order. We know that a government is well ordered when we are clear, somewhat clear, about who and what is present or absent, how these characteristics are manifested. For instance, the presence of law in the rule of law, the absence of the sovereign in representative government, also where legal and political um, energy impetus emanates from and how it is funneled into the cogs and wheels of, of government. In a deeper and more bothering way, political theology provides other such ordering tools. Uh, beyond the normative order of ordinary law, there looms a different alternative order of exception that can come into play at any time, for instance, in the case of war or a pandemic. So the coming into play of this alternative institutional reality requires a different legal philosophy based on a coupling of sovereignty with decision. Anthropological categories, life and death, violence, sacrifice, and so on, also account for how the political order works, how it can survive, and also more disturbingly, how it can collapse. 
So I have a part of the paper on this is the next slide, if I may, uh, <clears throat> Marco. I'm sorry, it's, uh, the print is too small. Maybe it's just not legible. But I, have, I'm, I will devote in the paper a uh, discussion on the reason and will as concepts and origins of order. I, I'm going to make it very, very quick here. I would say that reason and will work as a nexus between pre-modern theology and thought, on modern thought. Uh, in our secularized world of thinking, reason and will have persisted, but at the expense of undergoing a process of secularization. So really, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure my, uh, <laughs> my slide really works, but I would think that there's been what I call a passage through God. You had classical psychology in which human reason was um, part, something that an individual had, uh, uh, somebody had, an individual. There was human will, there was human reason. And then there is theology, the passage through God. It's God's reason, which is perfect, which is an absolute concept. Or well, there is God's will, uh, which is even more uh, perfect on, on authority. And then there is a passage from theology to law in which actually um, all the, um, the psychological characteristics have been removed. We don't think that human reason, that legal reason is actually individual or psychological. We don't think that the legislative will, for instance, is actually a psychological will. There are many, many, many ideas about legislative will, but many people would say that there is some kind of objective will, objective intention. This may or may not work. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> Uh, this is just food for thought. Uh, but in any case, as Paul points out, reason, and I quote him, reason has been stripped of its theological pretension by which it was imagined as an independent force pushing us from behind, unquote, an independent force pushing us from behind. Um, Paul also points out that, pro quote, project and system were long the attributes of God's reason. Now, he says, they have become our own. End quote. Uh, I would say two things about that. First, they are our own. We own reason, uh, but from the viewpoint of our collective practical reason, or more specifically in, the, in that smaller corner of the larger province of practical reason, which is named the law. Second, it may be the case that reason was our own from the beginning. Maybe also our anthropology and psychology have evolved. Reason and will have changed because the underlying view of human nature or the absence thereof have, has changed. So uh, the kind, and uh, I'm reaching my conclusion here, the kind of metaphysical world representation that persists uh, even in, in a secularized age has also changed. On this changes the meaning of such concepts as project and system. This is my last quote, thank you. My last slide. Paul is spot on when he said that in modern American law from Holmes to Langdell, quote, we see the possibilities of an imminent system of order in the absence of, of God, what I call imminent yet illuminated from within, as Ferguson says. I, I, I quote Paul again, what used to be imagined as the mind of God remains immanent in the phenomena. Reason, and he quote from Holmes, obviously, reason is not a brooding omnipresence is in the sky which was pure transcendence. It is a collective work understood not as a grand project, but as a system developing in history." Unquote. In, in a sense, thus, a project and system could appear as a general, all-encompassing concept that we're missing from uh, Paul's um, first project, uh, political theology. They were missing from political theology's toolbox maybe because political theology could not reach those very secularized concepts. I'm not sure. If so, this may have difficulties of its own. As project and system explain normality, not exception. They explain the ordinary, not the miraculous. It would seem that they are perfectly viable without theological implications, or aren't they? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Oh, slides. So, I need that. Sorry? No, no, he's just in the hotel room. Okay, so <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Um, the paper was supposed to be on um, the L School of Thought, and um, I need to apologize that I switched the topic, but the paper itself exists. Uh, it's going to be published in Marco's uh, journal. As a book review, and you can find it already online. It's called The Dead End of the New Haven School of the Constitutional Thinking. And interestingly, it actually is much more connected to the Nice paper than this current paper, because in this paper, I also try to explain the disappearance of reason and will from um, the origins of order. So, one of the weird things that happens in the origins of order. The, the two categories, it's it's shared. Oh, there's a lot of slides. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so the in the origins of order, the two categories of the system and um, what is the problem? There's no problem. No problem. No problem. No problem. No problem. Oh, it's fine. I'm, I like to help to think as a lawyer. That's the only way I think. So, um, yeah, so the categories of reason and will disappeared from uh, or are less evident in the uh, origins of order. And I try to explain why project and system took over, and the explanation comes. From your law school, that is very different than the theology explanation that uh, Denis just gave. It's interesting. And the second thing that I'm doing slides, I'm very happy that people here today are doing slides because uh, um, when I came out of Yale, I never did slides. And, uh, in the much better program, I was always uh, criticized for that and I capitulated. And now you will see I'm uh, completely on the dark side. I think if uh, Moshe Haldatar was here, it's probably me. <laughs> but uh, okay, so now I'll begin. I will say my argument, my uh, the gist of the argument, and then um, I'll go over it. So the gist of the argument is um, an attempt to explain this essentially what they call the cliche or a truism that the UK is a system of parliamentary sovereignty as opposed to a popular sovereignty. And you see here, it's connected to the referendum in, 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 the, in Miller, in the Miller case, in the Brexit case, and I will also deal with that connection. And so I'm trying to explain this tourism. I will try to look at the way that uh, UK law answers this question through the rule of recognition mostly. I will show the flaws of that and the merits of using project and system to explain this uh, phenomenon, I would say that that's a better, a better way to explain this phenomenon. We'll say something even more than that: that the rule of recognition, in a sense, is already a part of uh, a thinking according to a system, and that's why it cannot capture essentially popular sovereignty. And that's one of the reasons why in the U.S. the rule of recognition is a very unimportant thing. There is a complete book that tries to explain. It tries to insert it to the American constitutional discourse, and I would claim that because it's part of the thinking of the system, it cannot give a space to that. Now, I will try to demonstrate uh, my argument and that the UK thinks of this issue through a system way of thinking through a claim that was raised in Miller, a claim that is called the Clamp claim. That's why the title of this. Um, one of the reasons that the title of this uh, presentation is the clamp uh, argument, uh, the clamp of the UK constitutional thinking. So I will try to uh, present it through that, through actually a short clip from the argument in Miller. And then I will try to connect it also to constitutional statutes and other things as time permits. Now, the connection to Paul is in several levels. First, the use of system and project just to show the merits of this way of thinking. 
The second connection is um, the popular sovereignty that as we saw yesterday plays a strong, a very central role in explaining uh, in American constitutionalism, American thought. And the third connection is through the method. So um, the previous review that I wrote on post political theology, we had a, a debate, an ongoing debate on the method of how you demonstrate the arguments. One of the currents that we saw here in uh, yesterday mostly, and also today, is the sense that um, this, the investigation of political imaginary um, is sometimes a sense that the person who investigated is investigated is without any friction with reality. He is essentially investigating perhaps himself, his political imaginary rather than the uh, society's political imaginary. And that uh, was an, um, a debate between me and Paul. I wrote a review on, the, on his uh, article and he wrote a rebuttal. Um, and the rebuttal was the argument, the main argument in the rebuttal is that uh, essentially the summarize it correctly. I have no recollection. Is, so you can say whatever you like. <laughs> is essentially that the, the persuasion of an argument of a social imaginary is related to your embeddedness in the culture in which it comes from. Um, so the ability to judge a claim on the US would be uh, embedded in your being part of the uh, of the American reality to me it's such a very uh, personal call because when um, I wrote my dissertation in the Yale, I wrote on the US and that essentially answer meant that I could never fully <laughs> capture mm -hmm. the American uh, experience. And perhaps strategically, it was a very stupid idea to write <laughs> a dissertation on the US. Most of the people that go to the US to write a dissertation would write comparatively. Um, and it surely took me longer but I felt that I'm taking more courses than any JP students on American constitution. It was more years. So what's the problem? <laughs> um, so it touched a very um, deep chord, and this is a similar attempt, right? This is after similar years that I was at Yale, similar numbers of years. And I'm trying to say something about the UK. So let's say let's see if I'm I know enough about the UK to say something about its uh, imaginary. It's understanding of itself. Depends on where we are given. Yes, so that's that's, <laughs> that's what we are doing. Exactly what we are doing. Okay, so that's the question that I'm interested in. Whether uh, how can we explain the fact that this cliche that the US is the UK is a system of parliamentary sovereignty called popular sovereignty, while we know that um, the UK is still a democracy, right? And even Dicey, the person most responsible for conceptualizing the UK as a system of a parliamentary sovereignty, said, well, this is a democracy. In the end, um, the people win, right? In the end, uh, the popular sovereign is the, his will will win. So how can we explain these two currents? And the way the UK mostly explains it is through the rule of recognition. It's, it's through many variations of it, but the rule of recognition, as you know, is the way to recognize what law is. There are many phenomena in the world. Some of them are law. The rule of recognition gives us the rule of how to recognize them. In the UK, the rule of recognition is parliamentary sovereignty, right? What uh, parliament, Queen and Parliament met, that's, um, that's what is law. And um, that's the way that the answer is given to that. And, uh, and even Dyson gave the answer, even though they were before, of course, of course. So the idea is that parliamentary sovereignty is the way to recognize what law is, and the popular sovereignty works in the political level, right? So parliamentary uh, sovereignty works in the legal level. That's how we identify uh, what law is, and um, popular sovereignty is what happens in the uh, political way, right? It's a political, not a legal fact. And the electors can, in the long run, always enforce the will. The court will never take it into account because 
you identified the law through since you didn't use the law of recognition, but you can now apply this idea because it's uh, already inside his uh, thinking essentially. And then, um, as I said, what I'm trying to argue that this uh, answer is inadequate, and I will show its flaws in many ways. But the first way to show its flaws, its flaws is just to compare it to how the rule of recognition is applied in the US. Right? The US is a paradigmatic example of uh, popular sovereignty, and you would expect that the rule of recognition will have a different phrasing. But as you see, three attempts to apply the rule of recognition. Greenwald is the first one, he's the first one that actually wrote an article on the rule of recognition in the US. And he writes essentially, um, the same rule of recognition um, in the US in, in very similar terms to the UK. You see other examples, and uh, whatever people's status as, as a matter of deep political philosophy, the people, the people's will is not part of the ultimate legal uh, uh, rule of recognition for the legal order in the 19th states. So we see already there is a problem here, right? If we uh, see the US as the paradigmatic case of popular sovereignty, how is it that the rule of recognition there is essentially similar to uh, what is in the UK? There is something here that's a miss, and my claim is that essentially um, looking at it through a um, system and project is more adequate, but there can be alternative solutions that if you want, we can discuss them. Afterwards, one solution is to say that simply the UK is a popular sovereignty system, Another way to deal with it is that the UK, the US is not a popular uh, so sovereignty system near rhetoric. And a third way is to try to modify. I think all, well, all these three things are, do not work, but we can discuss them later. So the way uh, I suggest to approach this question is through a system and project that these are the categories that Paul offers in uh, the origins of order. So systems are systematic reason, project is based on will, um, the legitimacy of project is based on self-authorship. So whether there was a success of the popular sovereign expressing his project, leading his project, and the success in the system is based on application of the systematic law. The pathology of the system is uh, lack of success. And my argument is that in the UK, the thinking of the legal system, legal order, it's a system, the legal order is through uh, the category of system. And that, in a sense, as a clamp, blocks the horizons of how um, popular sovereignty is conceived. So, how do I show something like that? And that's not only my infliction of my ideas on the UK. So that's through the clamp argument. I will explain it. I hope I'm not going to lose you. I haven't crossed you already. And the clamp argument in Miller, and through it, I will try to demonstrate my argument. So Miller, to those of you who are not UK lawyers, Miller 1 is, and I'm a bit simplifying it, um, Miller 1 is the case of how the UK triggers Article 50 to the Treaty of the EU, right? There were two positions, the position of uh, the government that you do it through prerogative powers, right? Prerogative powers of foreign affairs. That's how we join and lead um, international agreements throughout the history. And the EU treaty is no different. The applicant said, no, we need legislation and uh, legislation by parliament. So these were the two arguments in Miller 1. Now, um, the clam argument enters into um, the controversy in the following way. The question was, what is the meaning of the ECA? The ECA is the European Communities Act that was enacted when the UK joined the EU, right? So the UK joined the EU in 73, 72. They are enacting the ECA. And the question is, what is the meaning, OK? What is the meaning of this act? Now, the applicants claim that the ECA created a clamp, created because it was legislated, it dealt with the EU, it created some kind of a clamp that 
um, constrains the ability to use prerogative powers. Mm -hmm. That was their claim. The government claimed there was no clan, but if there was a clan, the referendum as the voice of the people removed the clan. Right? And here the voice of the people enters the story. And what I'm trying to now to show you in a few minutes that you will see how the judges treat it is how the thinking of the judges works on an argument that is an argument of popular solidarity. So that's what we are, that's what I'm trying to show. I'm trying to show that they look at it through a system that they, um, in a sense, are clamped in a different manner. So I'm moving to the Miller argument. It's very few minutes, three minutes more. So it will work. Because the first one that we don't think is no more than that. It's just. So Okay, let's return to the presentation. So, um, I'm jumping a lot of time, so we'll take a few more minutes. So, as you can see, of course, the debate was very much discussed in uh, public discourse through the people versus the court, right? Um, I won't have time to go through what essentially they said, or the judges, 
but uh, the judgment itself, the clamp argument is very much uh, not really discussed. The only way it gets uh, some recognition is uh, in this a few other um, echoes in other paragraphs of the case. But essentially, um, as you saw with the judges, um, a distinction between the political and the legal popular uh, sovereignty is a matter of, uh, of the political and um, parliamentary sovereignty is a matter of legal. And the way they're doing it, and that's the things that I want to do, is first through something that I call the final theory. So one of the gaps between um, one of the things that was very difficult when we started teaching UK constitutional law, that in comparison to American constitutional law, political theory is much more on the face of it. So we deal in the first semester with um, clear principles of political theory, right? Parliamentary sovereignty is discussed. And in the US, the, these issues are discussed through a much, much thicker uh, level of doctrine. And constitutional doctrine, as many scholars say in the US, is in a sense uh, an addition to the constitution, right? And we discuss most of these issues through um, uh, doctrine. There is no discussion, almost no discussion in American uh, Supreme Court judges on the issue of, let's say, the government of the country. Right? It's not something that's, and in the UK, the discussion of political theory arguments is evident on the face of it, but it's not discussed through a theoretical lens. It's discussed as if it's part of doctrine. And the best way to see it is through the discussion that was on the supremacy of EU law as opposed to um, parliamentary sovereignty. Right? The entire discussion, all the solutions that were given were in a doctrinal sense, right? Ma a manner and form, rule of construction. There was an sense to accommodate principles, not through thinking in political theory, but through thinking in legal doctrinal tools. Um, and in a sense, that's a systematic thing. So even an issue like popular sovereignty, which is supposed to speak in a completely different manner than the legal discourse. It's supposed to be a rupture. It's supposed to be the people speaking themselves did not is not being expressed in that manner. It's always somehow suppressed under uh, ca categories of system, under the final categories. I will touch only with one more example because I'm already above my time. But it's a very important discussion. It's a very important example. So I want to discuss that as well. And that is constitutional statutes. So constitutional statutes in uh, the UK is a creation of a hierarchy of law of statutes that have a higher um, status than an uh, ordinary legislation. Now, the way the test to determine what is a constitutional statute in the UK is a substantive test. It looks on the substance of the law, not whether it had uh, public support, right? Compare it to a similar idea in the US, what is called a landmark statute or super statute, that in the US is determined by the support of the people. So whether they want. so that's a good example that again um, tries to show a, a different type of thinking in both systems uh, on how a popular a popular sovereignty is treated. So that's thank you. Thanks, but we we kind of we started this session rather late, so. Uh, if we were to stick to the timetable, we'd only have 20 minutes left. No, we're, not going to stick we're not going to stick to the timetable. So there's not going to be a break, let's say. This well, there wasn't going to be a break anyway, right? Or well, was there going to be a break? Yeah, yeah there was. Minutes, okay, so, okay, so <laughs> let's take at least 20 minutes then uh, for, 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 this, for discussion. And uh, uh, then, and if it, if it has to encroach in the last section, then I, for one, am prepared to sacrifice some yeah. of my time to use okay. the, the term du jour. But, uh, uh, oh. <laughs>
Um, these are both very complicated papers uh, that I feel like I need to to read and and, and think about, um, or maybe I'm just getting tired. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, Denis asked uh, some re really interesting uh, questions and makes some really good observations and got me thinking about a lot. Um, much of what he said, I think, uh, is un I don't think is very controversial about my work um, uh, on the on the political theology. Um, yeah, my my sense is yes, you've got it exactly right. Um, that um, and and uh, I I thought I've been really uh, clear about this and, and tried to say that well, what most people understand as political theology is um, or, or really um, and not what I understand by a, a political theology because they're theologians doing politics. Uh, and I'm uh, saying, no, uh, yeah, a political theology is, is trying to take politics on its own terms as, as a, a kind of, I don't know the right words, theological uh, 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 enterprise, but, but an enterprise that uh, has to take seriously dimensions of meaning um, that we don't ordinarily um, think about when we do legal uh, analysis. But, but it's definitely pitched against um, the theological project of, of uh, the political project of sectarian theologians, uh, uh, put it that way. So, so it is a project um, uh, uh, that is um, appropriate for a secular age. Uh, of course, it, it addresses what exactly is a secular age, how secular is our, our age. Uh, and it's true uh, uh, that it tries to shift the site of um, uh, uh, let's call it sacrality um, uh, from uh, a, um, a traditional religious position towards a, uh, a political position. Uh, and uh, my arguments are often about the way in which politics and the political steps into a space that for a long time was occupied um, by various uh, forms of religious uh, practice. So that's all true. Um, uh, and um, uh, so, so there's no, you know, there's no appearance of God in my political uh, theology, and, and 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 that would go against everything I'm I'm saying. Um, I, I'm not. I have to think about your use of the term metaphysics. It's uh, to me a, a very vague uh, a term. Of, of course, um, I think of this work as, as uh, about metaphysics uh, in in the sense that um, you know it's uh, it, 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 it's. If, if I think about metaphysics, I think about the, the, the fundamental structures of thought, fundamental structures of experience. And, and that's what I'm trying to get at. And so in that way, it's a metaphysical. You know, I think you also talked about ontology and I agree with that too. And particularly in political theology, I keep coming back to this idea that it's an existential project, which is related to this phenomenological uh, uh, claim. And, and of course, and this goes to Orr's constant complaint and uh, question, um, if you're doing metaphysics, political metaphysics, uh, so to speak, then, then what are your sources? Well, they're kind of the, the existential sources of trying to think about the nature of being. <laughs> what does it mean to uh, experience meaning in one dimension or another? And how do we identify it and think about it? So, so I agree with all of that. And I, and I actually really liked your chart. I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with you know, exactly how you do it, but, but you're, you're, you're exactly right. Um, and, and this goes to Orr's question in his earlier paper about what happened to reason and will. Well, re reason and will were categories that I had um, uh, adopted or picked up from classics, uh, from thinking about you know, the psychology of uh, Plato and Aristotle, uh, essentially. Um, and, and those categories uh, do then have a, you know, a theological history or religious history. Uh, uh, and, and then they're transformed again you know, in modernity, uh, and uh, they, you know, they do a certain amount of, of work, but but I, I think that the categories of project and system are are more appropriate, modern categories, so to speak. And at some place, I, I maybe I'm even addressing all when I say this, I don't remember. I say that's something to the effect that well, using project and system instead of reason and will allows us to see more continuities, more relationships with other disciplines, more ways of thinking about uh, how does you know political and legal thinking fit in with you know the development of social darwinism or it's fit in with the development of anthropology uh, and all of these 19th century uh, developments um, so i think that's all all right and of course um, 
Uh, you're, you're right uh, when you talk about um, re reason and will um, it, it, in their project and system form have, have been de-psychologized uh, very, very, um, in, in some uh, deep way. And, and I think that's characteristic of our way of thinking about them in the law as well. And you know that's one of the things that drives me crazy about these primitive uh, originalists who forget this, <laughs> uh, it, 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 it seems to me. So, so uh, I, I agree with all, all, all of those points. Uh, I need to think about them more, but I think they're all tracking real you know, developments of the way I think about these, uh, about these uh, um, problems. Um, now I'll say something that may be too wild or a little bit off or, or whatever. It wasn't exactly my intention, but you, you forced me over the last few weeks to try and think more about the relationship between the political theology project, you know, that book, and origins uh, of order, and, um, and 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 it goes to our earlier conversation, the earlier question about where's uh, what's the relationship between the cultural study of law and freedom. Uh, and in my thinking, at least, um, political theology. Although I don't know that I, I knew this when I set out to write the book, which I really set out to write a book in which I just tried to think through what Schmidt was trying to do okay, here and make sense of it in terms of my own projects I'm thinking. Uh, and, um, but political theology is, as, a, as a work, that book uh, is about freedom. I mean, that's the driving force of this book. It, it's, it is about the decision as the free act. Uh, and that, that's what characterizes the decision. It's a free act. It comes as if from nowhere. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, I don't remember what the, the Kierkegaard quote is on this, but it's, it's the moment of madness. I think he says, why is that? Well, it's the moment at which explanation ends. A decision must be made. Uh, uh, and, and, and the structure of, uh, of the book is the elaboration of that thought in increasingly complex uh, uh, ways. Um, and, and that's the moment for me, the important part of the book in some ways is the dissolution of the distinction um, between the exception of the rule uh, between chapters one and two, because I argue that deep into law, a decision still has to be made. Uh, so that's the judgment of decision. And that's, that's the ordinary workings of, of law. So, so actually law is a domain of freedom all the way down. Uh, and, um, and then chapter three is about, again, about freedom as modeled on discourse. We were saying before about how, how does language work? So, so, uh, so political theology is my metaphysical inquiry into the nature of freedom, uh, which makes it a, a, you know, a book about, uh, in, in the end, I keep saying in the book kind of a mantra, you know, existence before essence. Well, that, that's the, the, the idea of freedom before uh, what form. Um, Origins of Order picks up on that. It's not a book about freedom, really, uh, in, in that sense. It's, it's a book about uh, how we, uh, in, uh, about context, about how we narrate when we, after we make the decision, we're making the decision, we still have to provide a narrative, an explanation. What are the narratives that are available to us? Uh, what are the ways we, uh, you know, uh, negotiate, navigate within the decisions we ha have to make? Uh, and, and so it's a, it's a, a book about, um, it takes quite a different perspective, not the perspective of the, 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 the moment of decision, but the perspective of the moment of explanation, <laughs> all right? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I think that you know, these, are, these are necessarily complementary, um, but, but they're not logical parts of one thing. They're the double aspect of the human condition, I would say, freedom and context, freedom and situation. We have to understand our history, even as we make uh, decisions, we have to project forward into the future, even in ways, uh, even though we're not, you know, not not determined by it. So, so I think of the books as, as kind of working on, um, you know, I don't want to say separate planes, but but taking two radically different perspectives towards what we can think about as our situatedness. Uh, one emphasizing um, that, that situatedness is. He's never releases us from the context, from the uh, uh, necessity of the decision. At no point are we freed from that. Uh, on the other hand, it gives us, um, we, we are always orienting ourselves with it, within that and, and, uh, and system and project are ways of uh, orienting. Now I do think on um, system and project, he said something else that I think is very true that is inadequately treated in the book. And, 
you know, uh, at some other time when we're in Paris, we can talk about the that list of particular examples about whether those really are remnants. But it's inadequately treated in the origins of order. What? Which book is it? You said it's inadequately treated in the book. Oh, what I'm about to say, or in order to yeah, order. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I don't pursue as much as I maybe should have, um, because I was I was quite uh, fascinated by these concepts. But you know, I, I kind of understood in the back of my mind and make reference to it at times that this is my variation on transcendence and imminence. Uh, and uh, uh, projects are of the, the perspective of transcendence system. This is is imminence, um, and these are the religious, you know, these, these are the religious forms of these categories. But they're doing doing the same sort of uh, of, of thing, um, and um, so so again, maybe maybe we would have a three part, you know, graph of what happens to these categories as they, they move from the classical to the to the um, uh, because I am very clear that you know I, these are not categories of modernity in the sense that somehow we invented them. These these categories are categories of experience all the way back. Um, uh, so, so I do think, you know, um, uh, the, uh, you know, you, you could call the uh, origins of order a book about political theology as well, if you simply thought about it as transcendence and imminence. Uh, uh, and, um, so I, I agree with that point, uh, as, as well. Um, you know, um, Maybe I'll just end, 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 end there, but I do think um, um, I don't. I think I think the one point we may disagree about um, is um, what was theology ever doing? Uh, and, and here I would be inclined to say, well, from the point of view of the seculars, for, uh, theology was never anything more than metaphysics, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so so it's it's not. It's not that something's been lost when we move from theology to metaphysics. It's um, that we're, we're taking up the same set of uh, concerns and occupations uh, of trying to explain the conditions in human, what I would say, human freedom. Uh, and uh, uh, and um, so, so it shouldn't be surprising uh, that we move in, a, in, a, in an easy direction from theology to metaphysics. Those are my first thoughts. Or, you know, um, you know, you, you know you it's true. I'm, I'm quite sure uh, about my our, our long argument about whether the, the whether membership is a necessary condition of interpretation is correct <laughs> uh, in, in in our conversation about the U.S. But but now you really I I don't know what's going on in in in, in the, the U.K. with. Uh, uh, a popular sovereignty or not, but um, but I, but I, I wonder about and, and this kind of goes to a longer disagreement. Although recently I found myself you know relying on you, so maybe you're winning the argument by the by my uh, in in the long run. So, um, but um, what do you mean by popular sovereignty in the U.S.? Um, you know, it's a really interesting question because you're setting up this. This uh, contrast, but but I wouldn't have thought that a popular sovereignty in the U.S. has much to do with referendum. With well, referenda, well, it's the voice of the people. I agree with you. Okay, so it's the voice of the people, but that's an interpretive problem, you know. And and and, and so when I think about popular sovereignty, you know, uh, in the U.S., I don't, I, I you know, I, I I think about it as, you know, the problem of popular sovereignty. We were talking about this yesterday in, in the U.S. It's the problem of persuading people to believe that they are the authors of the law. Uh, and uh, referendum is not a very good way to do that. You know, the, the, uh, all of that stuff at the beginning of Martin's paper, that's the way popular sovereignty works in the US, I believe that we, we have to be persuaded that there's a, a transgenerational community that constitutes a subject that has a project. Um, uh, and um, what are the markers of that? How does the court interpret it? Where does it see it? How does it relate to it? Law as opposed to other phenomena. All of these are, you know, complicated issues. Um, so, um, so, so your focus in the Miller case, and I don't really know the facts in the Miller case. I don't, I don't know, I don't know it at all. But, but I, I wouldn't have thought the contrast that I would be looking for would be between a legal expression and the place of understanding popular referenda. 
uh, you know, in, in this is maybe a side point, maybe not directly on point, but in my in my new book, which you have not been given, um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, on uh, democracy in America, you know, I, I talk about how undemocratic referenda are, you know, um, yeah, yeah, and and not not a moment of popular sovereignty at all, but a, a moment in which factions can seize control in one way or another, and plagued by problems, and they have, you know, they are decision making mechanisms. Well, a lot of things that are decision-making mechanisms, right? But but their legitimacy can't be because they are uh, expressions of the popular will. They're just opportunities for whoever wants to get involved to make a decision to get involved, right? Uh, which may be, may be just, but it's not, you know, to, to, to use common distinction, it might be just, but it's not legitimate, you know? Uh, you might as well, uh, 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 so, um, so so I'm, I was a little bit surprised that that's the point at which you would do the comparison. I always thought, and I always had a very sim simple idea about this, um, uh, which is that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you know, as you as you begin with, you know, uh, people have very simple-minded ideas about about the contrast here. But but I I, I always thought that the idea of uh, in in the in the UK was that well, um, the common law stems from time immemorial. So the background condition against which political action occurs is a commitment to the common law. It's always been there, so to speak. Uh, uh, and um, so in, in, in terms of your paper, um, the common law is not a project, right? It's not a, not a project. Uh, any exercise of sovereignty, therefore, is against that background, right? And in the US, we convert it. Uh, uh, that the origins of law, the law has not always been there. Law has a, has a moment of beginning. And that's, a pro that's an idea of project. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, sovereignty precedes law in, 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 in uh, that sense. So is the common law obviously a system in your, your idea? You said it's yeah. not a project, so it's a system. <coughs> talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not contrasting what I said. Uh, so, but, that, but that has nothing to do with popular referendum, that's all I'm saying. No, oh, uh, yeah. so the referendum is just an attempt to show a moment in which popular sovereignty enters the game and how it's treated. Yeah, but that might be a completely different idea of popular sovereignty. If you said, look, it, it, that would be like um, asking an American court, you know, how do you deal with elections? Uh, uh, because that's a moment of popular sovereignty and, and popular expression, right? And they might say, well, it's irrelevant, uh, uh, the uh, uh, elections, but. But um, there's still a distinction between a system of popular sovereignty as a project and a system of law as something like common law. I don't know about common law. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is a very simplified view of how I understood the, the distinction between the two, the two orders in a way that uses this idea of project and system. Uh, and um, so, so I, I might be completely off about, about UK law. But, that, that, that was my, my reaction. Okay. Looking around the table, I'm getting the sense that we've reached 22 miles in the marathon and people are just beginning to hit the wall. But, <laughs> <laughs> so let's take some 10, 15 minutes of questions on this and then move to the final session. Our replies, huh? Oh, well, yeah, okay. But, or, or do you want to? I'm just thinking in terms of time. Okay, Dennis, you, you go first. But make it brief. <laughs> well, well, make it very brief because I, I don't disagree with Paul not disagreeing with me. I mean, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, I'm thankful for his comments. And uh, <clears throat> and again, I might have some doubts about uh, the overall reference to theology, but he says very well why it shouldn't be taken uh, uh, um, I wouldn't say seriously, but it, it, it's not exactly theology and he knows it. So fine, fine, fine by me. Um, really, no, no, I'm, I'm very grateful for Paul's uh, orientations about his own work. And I, I don't really have um, comments to strike back with. Uh, prop, prop, no, the, the only thing is, uh, <clears throat> One should be careful when one uses theology in any context because um, the, the reference to theology has an impact that may not um, be uh, underestimated. 
And when Schmidt puts political theology on the table, he is an apologist, he's, he's an ideologue, and he is very clear about what he does. He does a conservative metaphysics with a view to criticizing liberalism. And uh, I think Paul does too, in a sense. I was struck by Paul's attacks on liberalism in, in, in both uh, the books I have commented. So um, one should be careful, uh, I wouldn't say what, what one wishes for, but the word that you are using on the, the reference to theology probably involves, uh, I, would, I would say a, a shift in time, but as, that's not going to save the nine, that's not going to save us. We, um, we, on, on, and then again, there was a lot in theology, in, in, in religious thinking, especially in, in, Christian, in Christianity, which is the only thing that I know a little bit about. Theology is not everything. <clears throat> when people do, a, for instance, the reference to uh, <clears throat> the uh, signs of, of sovereignty in Jean Baudin, it was not drawn from theology, it was drawn from, from apologetics. And when you draw an argument from apologetics in, in Christianity, it is not meant to be rational, it is meant to be convincing. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not really criticizing Paul, he did extremely well in, in, in the book, which is a remarkable book by all means, but uh, maybe origins of order is the consequence of, I wouldn't say the dead ends of political theology, but the limits of a project based on somebody else's project when, when this person is Carl Schmidt, if you see what I mean. So be, be careful who your friends are or who your references are. What I would have liked to do in, 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 in what maybe I will do in the paper if it's published, is to say that there is a big difference between Paul and Schmidt. Schmidt is a master of um, of, of, of lying to people, of using, uh, uh, of, of, of deceiving. He's a master deceiver. Paul is never that. Paul is always in earnest. On the there is a, str a strong element of ethics. Paul, you mentioned yesterday um, freedom and method, which is really an article that I admire because it's a perfect ethics of um, academic. Um, law of academics do, doing law. We, we, we have to have an ethics, which I don't think Schmidt did. So um, I, 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 I draw a big difference between Paul and Schmidt, obviously, but uh, then again, there, there might have been a limit to the project of political theology in the first place. I stop there. Okay, thank you. Sir. So I'm not right. because I am to run now. It's so lucky to meet you. Brilliant. Yeah. And, time and, and hopefully we can have your patience for the publication. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. We shall talk about it okay. shortly. Okay. 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 Cheers. Right. Thank you. So the two, co two comments to Paul. One of is about the paper. Uh, your comments on the means. Something that struck me. So one of the things is there is a closeness between you and Schmidt that both of you have a that's very much related. dealing with let's call the big letters and the small letters if you want to say a Greek analogy. So you have an issue of what is the meaning of the order of the US. Or how do you feel putting liberalism in its place? How do I feel the neutral issue that this is not a neutral system? We have a meaning and that meaning is popular sovereignty. That's one level, which we had the same thing. And both of you are also engaged with the issue of the decision on the small norm. That's the small letters, right? How a norm decides a case. Both of you are engaged with these two questions, which is interesting with both of you. And Schmidt had a problem in putting these two questions together, right? That's, the, that's actually the point in which he switches to Nazism. He has in this article both these strengths. How do I decide between the two? Because there is a tension between them. Because if you say that the decision is come as if from nowhere, what does the meaning in the big letters, what will be in the decision, right? If there is a meaning to the legal system, that meaning should dictate the decision in the small letters. It should give, it shouldn't come from nowhere. You have the content, right? And that in both of you, it's a tension, I think. So that's one comment. The other comment is about what you said about the popular sovereignty. And that's uh, both the problems I have with the method and a problem. So obviously when you do social imaginary, you investigate how popular sovereignty is used by the, so I think that it's very hard sell to say in both the US and the UK that popular sovereignty and referendum are conflicting. 
So perhaps it's your use of popular sovereignty, but how sovereignty is popular sovereignty is understood by the judges, by others, is that it has its connection to the people's voice. So it's true, it's not a perfect uh, system, it's not anything. I'm not saying that the plan is perfect, but it's surely in how our social imaginary connects to popular sovereignty. And I think it's different than elections, because here you give the people a voice outside of the general system of elections, that the general system of elections is already embedded in the distinction between law and politics. You cannot say in the legal system, I want the election, so you need to expect, accept my um, argument. But in Miller, the question was exactly in the clamp argument, and that's why I brought it, whether I can say that because the referendum was the voice of the people, it tilts the argument in a certain way. So that's my argument in that. Okay, uh, the floor is open. Okay. I, just to follow up on that point, though, but I mean, I'm I'm a bit and you'll excuse me because I jumped out to Lou in the middle of the the speeches that you show, but like surely the decision could have gone the other way, right? And and a lot of these cases that you're talking about could have gone the other way. So um, the fact that they could have gone the other way, that there were judges who thought the other way about it, or incentive. But like, not on that point. No one, no one gave the referendum a meaning. A meaning in, in the sense that it tilts the way. Yeah. Reed has a, a certain thing that he says about it, but no one in the end said that uh, the, the referendum changes. That the referendum, so, all of them agree it's a political uh, thing. So I see where you are going, but I think all of them okay. were under the expertise horizon. No uh -huh. one was able to go beyond it and say, well, this is a rupture and we are giving it a voice that. But some have said that constitutional statutes become constitutional statutes because of the product of referenda. So you mean an argument that is uh, academic? Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Well, no, 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 no. That, that argument was made by Lord Hope, for example. You know, when one of his arguments were saying that the Scotland Act was a constitutional statute, was that it was a product of the referendum. I, I am unaware of that. I know there is an academic from that came from Yale that wrote an article now in uh, Oxford legal, stu legal Studies that is trying to say why won't we adopt on understanding constitutional statutes the idea from the US of landmark statutes. Let's give popular yeah. sovereignty a place. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's but he at least presented as something that was never suggested in the UK. So I will check. <coughs> yeah, but you see, there is there's a part of that debate which actually is about the relationship between Scottish and the Scottish independence debate and the UK debate, and there. I, mean, I don't think I don't think it contradicts your argument. I'm just saying it complexifies it. No, no, it's not that complex. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the reasons I think that the UK has a problem with saying popular sovereignty is the Scotland, right? In section 63A of the Scotland Act, mm -hmm. it speaks on the, pe the people of Scotland, right? So it's a problem. If you have the people of Scotland, how did they come together with the people of the UK? So that's all. no doubt part of the problem. Mm -hmm. the, the problem. It's not constitution as such. It's not the judges' adherence to, and all your analysis for indicated, adherence to a legal positivist mindset. That's it. And in a legal positivist mindset, obviously, they can't deal with the broader political questions that you're dealing with, because the whole of the legal positivist mindset indicates there is a thing called law, and there's something else beyond law, that's the world of politics. But it's a constructed uh, divide, it's a constructed difference. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm saying, but what, all, your, all your paper is revealing is that our judges are still fixed within a legal positivist mentality. The, the indication that they've been breaking out from it is in Miller too, where they start rattling up calling conventions constitutional principles. God help us when they continue with that. But, but, but your point is that that brand of legal positivism fits very much within a system framework. Yeah. Yes, I think that. Yeah, I think Americans are also positivists. Yeah, but it's a legal, 
Yeah, but this is about the system project distinctions. But you can give you can give a meaning in a positivism to other. The rule of recognition doesn't say you need to. You can say I am now acknowledging what the people said, and that's my rule of recognition. That's the question whether you can give the space to that and according to them, no. The rule of recognition is climate. I just think the rule of recognition is a positivist construct too. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But but the point isn't that the you the clamp. The point is that the way in which you use a rule of recognition, you know, to to in a sense provide a, a framework for thinking about law as a system precludes. The kind of opening you would need for popular sovereignty and for it to be project based. Yeah. yeah. I think I think I think that's a, if you buy the system project distinction, I think that's a good reading of, of Miller One. Yeah. But Paul was right when he says um, common law is system and legislative will is project. Except common law is not a system because the system's got to be rational. <laughs> but I think I think the strength the strength of Paul talking about system and he's going to just give it in here is is a modern system. Again, I think I'm with Denny. I think yeah, system and project have pre-modern origins, but I think the way that we think about them in the modern age is very very different, and that's why I have problems with the idea of a common law as a system. Yeah. So, Sorry, Denny. Uh, uh, silence. You're on mute. Should someone be so mean as uh, trying to sink Paul's argument about the common law being a system, not a project, which would be very mean indeed? One could quote Matthew Hale on the argument of the common law uh, being. A some sort of boat which is rebuilt progressively but it's still the same boat you know that i mean you, you change all uh, everything in the boat but it remains the same boat at the end of the day you can i think you can very well um, uh, um, understand or explain account for the common law as the project on the system at the same time at the time people in england were um, aristotelians which basically someone like Cook uh, was in, in the first place. When you're an Aristotelian, you understand the system as being a project because there is a final cause which determines the meaning of what is systematic in the system. So there is some kind of purpose, a final end to everything, which just justifies the systematic nature of the system itself. So I, I really, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to be, mean or too critical, but you can perfectly account for the common law as being a project or some sort of hybrid between a project on, on the system, as I think the classics did. It's not, it's not mean at all. There is a scholar, not accidentally, that came from Yale, which is a doctor to document, that presents the entire UK system as a pro, uh, UK legal order, as a project, risk of violence, right? You read the entire he does a tour of the entire history of the UK. This is an OJLS. Yeah. No. Entire risk of violence. Yeah, but it, it's, it's called the JMS. Where it is published. Public. It's public law. In public law. It's published. It's it's published. published. It's anyway, membership is a necessary condition of interpretation. <laughs> you see? You see? That's <laughs> the spot now. So she does a complete reading. So and, that's what very, think about and that's a very okay. interesting exercise in understanding what Paul's saying, because she does a complete history of the UK. Constitutional you history. Say through history. history. She makes some ridiculous claims. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> she does a historical account of the. I, I legal, draw complete history. Legal, and, you, and you read it. <laughs> so, okay, what is wrong with it? Because it's obviously that if she's correct, the entire legal academia and uh, jurist in the UK is under a false conscience, right? They think they are under parliamentary sovereignty, but they are actually a project of popular sovereignty. Um, so it's an interesting exercise in just understanding how Paul, um, the, the method of Paul. Well, I think Paul's method is relevant to the UK only in this respect, respect, and that is 
that we have this crazy gang, common law constitutionalists, <laughs> who are seeking, they have a project to make the common law a system. <laughs> and the system within which all other projects like letters of will have to be accommodated. So that's where <laughs> they're trying to get rid of will as the foundation of British constitutional understanding and replace it with system. Uh, that could be read as a way of getting rid of the monarchy, get rid of will as a way of understanding. <laughs> Is it, again, a kind of a definitional issue? Um, I, my reading of the conversation between Denis and Paul is that you maybe have two different understandings of what theology is. Um, and so, I, I, I mean, the, the question is going to be, what's your definition of theology? And is it um, something that's derived from uh, the work of theologians or is it something different? I mean, actually, all religions define theology slightly differently. And so there are lots of nuances to get into there. But one of the um, definitions given by Aquinas is that it's knowledge of the nature of God, knowledge of the teachings of God, and knowledge of the path to God. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily how you're using the term in the way that you're handling it, maybe. I'm a Denny. Um, let, let me say two things. And this is the last word. Okay. Oh, three yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'll probably forget. Uh, <laughs> Um, the first goes back to a, a point that Bohr made earlier about the problem that Schmidt and I have about getting from the large letters to the small letters. Um, and uh, I have no doubt that's right if, from one perspective. Um, uh, but I also have no doubt that it's wrong from another perspective, uh, which is the perspective of what do we expect of the kinds of inquiry that I'm suggesting uh, or trying to sketch out, sometimes trying to do. And there, there's a, a point, I don't remember where it is in the cultural study of law, in, in, in which uh, I give a bunch of rules. Uh, and one of them is nothing turns on the individual case. Um, and it's a mistake uh, to think that um, the movement, the, the capital letters determine the outcomes of the small letters. The whole point is, um, uh, sometimes I put it this way, from perspective of the rule of law, the dissents are just as good as the majority opinions. The dissents aren't different from the majority opinions in the fact that in the idea of one is law, one, one is a legal argument, the other one is not. So one has more votes than the other. Uh, and they could switch places and you'd still be, there'd still be an affirmation of, of the rule of law. So if you can make any judgments about what the cultural study of law is what's going on. You need a much larger frame uh, than just the particular case. Cases come out different ways for, for lots of reasons. Uh, and that's the first chapter of making the case, which I say, well, you know, here's, here's the situation. And, and there are a lot of good arguments on both sides. You know, which one wins? Well, I can't tell you why one of them wins because to tell you why one of them wins, and this goes to the point I wanted to make with you before, that, that the, the kind of legal cultural inquiry I do doesn't try and explain why one of them wins. Mm -hmm. To do that, you have to step outside and you have to talk about, well, the party's power, uh, you know, and, and, I mean, there's a million things that, that are going in, like, you know, and, and to the trivial, you know, who had dinner with whom the week before? I mean, all of these things don't have to be realistic or are contributing to outcomes. So, so I completely, abandoned early in my career, you know, any calls of claims. Uh, I, I can't explain, uh, uh, it, it's not deductive in it, and I'm not quick to talk about cause. I like to talk about causation as much as anybody else, but, but there I'm just, you know, speculating doing the historian's work or something. Or, or, or something. Uh, so I don't think that the movement from the capital letters to the small letters is anything that we can be, mm. can be expected in the individual case. All right. Um, of course, the, the, the movement has to be traced over time, right? Um, and um, but 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 one traces it not as you know uh, a you know a working out of the truth of the matter. The working out of the truth of the matter is always a retrospective view. Here's the account we give, which we give now as 
for working out the truth of the matter. It's not prospective, but um, but there are still transformative cases like Roe versus Wade, which are more significant than other cases. Roe versus Wade was not a transformative case when it was decided, ah. right? Right. It becomes a, a transformative case when it occupies a certain place in the arguments and imagination about about law. Um, so, so, and, and and I don't believe. You know, here we can argue forever. I, I don't believe the overruling of it will be transformative. Uh, I believe the transformations already occurred. Uh, in, and uh, this is just kind of a you know perfunctory, you know, uh, <laughs> completing it. So, so I believe it's going to have huge political consequences. Huge political consequences is going to you know, uh, and the decision Rovers with original decision had huge political consequences. Transforming in that that sense, uh, uh, I suppose. Um, so, but but, but, but it, this goes to you know again the difference between these two books too. You know what is the perspective of which you take? You take the, the moment of decision or the frame within which we put it and think about it, etc. Um, that's point one. I've already forgotten uh, points two and three. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. Uh, um, what were we talking about? We were talking about common law. Oh, uh, a, a response to Denny. Um, again, this is a subject for a much longer conversation, but but I don't think that system thought is uh, 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 in, independent of having a final causes. Uh, I, I think lots of systems are teleological. We have a telos, uh, that the distinction between project and system isn't in final causes, it's in efficient causes uh, uh, and uh, design. These are, you know, and, and and so the, the the boat that's being replaced plank by plank that's a you know that's an interesting interesting case you know uh, uh, but but the absence of a you know certain systems we don't think of a telos but well, lots of them do uh, we think of them as striving you know including growth you know re realizing you know the imminent order so 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 that's complicated and I think you know there's I, I I'm thinking a lot about that these days because. Um, um, there are systems that uh, uh, some system systemic thought is the realization, as I say often, of imminent principles, as if there's a truth to be realized. But but other systems are just systems of of growth, uh, uh, and change is built into them. Uh, maybe common law is a system like that. I don't I don't know. Uh, and um, uh, that was the second point, and I really forgot the third. Anyway. That's great. Thank you. Right. We're okay. We have the. We have a logistical problem of fitting an hour into 35 minutes. Uh, so uh, I, I think we want to do a couple of things in the in this last 35 minutes. I think we have to uh, respect the fact that Amalia and Miguel both want to say something over a few minutes. I'll say something, but I'll keep it very, very short. I also want to say something about publication. I also want to give uh, Benjamin, because he's back here and he's up very, very early this morning, a chance to just say you know, one or two sentences at some point. And Paul, of course, should have the final, 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 final right of reply at the very end. But uh, I think on, on the order of things, unless anyone... Uh, uh, actually, we could flip it over and Miguel, if you want to go first, and then Amalia could go second, and then I could go third. That would that be... You look, you look primed to speak, Miguel. So you know, <laughs> I don't, you, look like you're, you look as if you're about to do a kind of Formula One thing. So maybe we should let go uh, uh, and start things off. Yeah, that's fine. Um, that's fine. Um, so um, sorry for the voice, not hundred percent okay. <clears throat> Uh, I have one question to you because we didn't discuss the format of the panel, so it was a kind of informal discussion. So I have a series of points that I could raise. I can raise them uh, all at once. It will take a bit more time, perhaps, or I can go. I can raise the first one, and if we want to discuss, and then I'll raise some of the other ones. I don't know. It's the, the, the both the papers, uh, Paul's work, uh, and the discussion of the last couple of days led me to raise a variety of points. So I don't know, uh, how should I go about it? I think we just hear all of your points and we'll, we'll respect the fact that they're different points, but we'll just okay. hear them all. Okay, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and uh, so um, I'll try to be brief on each one of them so it can be some discussion. Um, my, my first point is actually uh, uh, related to a paper I've been working for uh, some years now um, engaging with, with Paul's work and the idea of um, 
um, on the cultural study of law uh, and trying to see the extent to which that could be useful to identify whether we have a European constitutional culture uh, uh, or whether in fact, uh, um, not only uh, uh, we do not have, uh, we have a European constitutionalism without a European constitution as we often say, but in fact, we may also have a European uh, um, constitutionalism without a European constitutional culture. Uh, if, if I understand correctly, I mean, um, uh, Paul has said that constitutional culture tends to exist when representation translates into identity. That is when the, when the representation embodied in the dominant constitutional narrative is susceptible to generate identity. Um, uh, my question is, uh, the, the question that has been occupying me in that respect is the extent to which uh, um, do we have such a constitutional culture? Uh, um, and, and can there be a constitutional culture even if it does not generate identity? I think Paul's works and vision is that, is that there cannot. Um, uh, and, and what does that tell you? Is the, do we genuinely have a, a, a European constitutional culture or is European constitutionalism about changing national constitutional cultures but not able uh, uh, to develop its own constitutional culture. If we look about the way that uh, European uh, um, legal scholars and constitutional legal scholars um, narrate the idea of a constitutional culture in Europe, it's much more about uh, um, a common European constitutional culture than a genuine European constitutional culture. And let me explain the difference. Uh, the focus is all on what is common uh, uh, in the constitutional culture of the different member states and not about what is unique in EU constitutional culture. Uh, um, I, I would argue that the fact that there is a lot in common between the European national constitutional cultures doesn't mean that we have a European Union constitutional culture. And, and in my view, there's two ways to address this and address this dilemma and this difficulty. One uh, um, is, um, is to try to identify a, a different myth than the one that is focused on the commonality of national constitutional cultures. And that will be one that paradoxically will be about the extent to which European constitutionalism is, is contested itself. And, 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 and the way to look into it uh, you will enjoy this, Neil, but Martin will hate it, will be constitutional pluralism. So constitutional pluralism could, would actually be the foundation for a European constitutional uh, culture. The other way to look into this into a possible way to try to develop such an European constitutional culture is to looking for sacrifice. And, and several of the papers and the discussion the last couple of days will be in that. What could be the equivalent of the European sacrifice or the willing to sacrifice in Europe? Will it come from the Euro, Euro crisis, from the pandemic, from the Ukraine? Uh, uh, but I would like in this respect to note something. It's not enough for a sacrifice to exist or to be susceptible of existing. In Paul's view, if I understand it correctly, it's necessary for a myth to be built around such sacrifice. Uh, 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 and the extent to which we've been doing that and successfully in Europe, I, I have my doubts. Another, another issue that I would like to, to, to raise uh, that hasn't really been addressed the last couple of days, but I, I think it's interesting in the, in the work of Paul and Paul Maywon, it's exactly the centrality of the role of legal scholars and, and judges. Uh, um, they are kind of exegesis or narrators of the myth, but at the same time, because they, 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 they have given such roles, they, they also build the, the myth. So they have a centrality a tremendous centrality in the development of, of, of political identity. Uh, um, uh, but, uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, in, in, in the United States, the, the myth of constitutional law as revealing a kind of imminent truth embodied in its history and its rules uh, uh, is developed by constitutional scholars but is developed by constitutional scholars in a way that fits the representation in the broader citizenry imaginary. And my question is, is the extent to which in the European Union, we do the same thing, 
or it is not much more insulated. Uh, 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 the, uh, the extent to which the way that constitutional uh, scholars of EU law try to develop this myth, it's much more insulated from this relationship with what is the citizenry imaginary. So in order for this to be a successful enterprise, you will need both. American constitutional scholars are able to do both. I doubt that we've been able to do that in European uh, uh, constitutional scholarship. Uh, a third issue that, uh, and this one comes from actually from the discussion that, that, uh, and, uh, that I followed in the last couple of days. Uh, and this is a, mostly a question for, for Paul. I'm starting to wonder, wondering if the, the real important concept is not sacrifice, but faith. Uh, uh, yesterday, we talked a lot about the idea that the sacrifice might not actually exist, but only be uh, uh, an hypothesis, uh, the hypothesis of the sacrifice or the hypothetical will to engage in sacrifice might be enough without an actually sacrifice, without uh, uh, an actual scar. Um, but I wonder if, if, in fact, one should not look this even further uh, 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 and whether the concept of faith, uh, it's actually one that is more interesting. And, and faith entails a belief that is supported in emotion, uh, but does not necessarily need to entail a sacrifice. I mean, uh, uh, the importance of this idea of faith could be uh, equated with, with an example I often use to, to students drawn from, from Dante's Divine Comedy. I mean, Dante's, Dante's is, is guided through hell and purgatory by Virgil, that is the, uh, um, in, 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 Italian, in Italy at the time was the embodiment of reason. Uh, but then he's welcomed into paradise by Beatrice, that is the love. And, uh, uh, and it's also the, um, is, uh, embodies the idea of faith. So uh, Dante believes that the, true, the two are necessary. Uh, and I wonder if it's not the same thing with, with Paul and if it would not be interesting to reconstruct his work in light of that. I mean, a faith in a common destiny uh, uh, is what ne is necessary, in fact. It's, that's that's what, what the myth is about. Uh, and it may be based on scars, uh, uh, um, but without necessarily entailing uh, uh, those scars or, 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 or a readiness to sacrifice. Um, and uh, to use something that Neil was mentioning, I think today, maybe an utopian vision, such as the one the European Union to a certain extent is based on, can also uh, be supportive of that act of faith towards that political community without necessary sacri sacrifice being required. So this is my question to, to Paul and the extent to which this, this could be one way uh, of overcoming some of the difficulties, for example, in the EU context. Then I, I have a, a, a two final issues that I wanted to raise, two items. I, I apologize. I, I try to be really beef with you. Uh, um, uh, one is the, that basically bring in part, uh, um, one is a tension that I believe exists and that explains a lot of the discussions surrounding Paul's work, that is a tension between the need for politics and the political, what makes politics possible. Uh, 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 and I think uh, some of the skepticism of Paul, more recent work and the way he sees the world today and, 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 and political institutions and democratic regimes today is because of this increasing gap. So what makes politics necessary, um, that is interdependence, basically, to use the, the work of an Italian-American archaeologist, Bucciolati, that wrote a nice book about the origin of politics, and, and basically he sees it in the beginning of the urban areas because they created the levels of interdependence without pre-existing rules um, being members of tribe or family to solve those conflicts. And that's what in his view creates the need for politics. And, 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 uh, but these needs for politics do not necessarily coincide with what makes politics possible, particularly in, the, in, the, in, 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 in Paul's uh, um, work. So there is an increasing gap on this interdependence beyond the state is one way to do it, but also increased internal fragmentation within states, as you see. So my question to him is, how do we address this tension 
be between because his, his work is mostly about what makes politics possible. But at the same time, we have a different thing is what makes politics necessary. And the gap between the two has been increasing. Uh, so how do we address that? Uh, and this leads me to the final point that is, is increased skepticism with uh, the current capacity of, of um, political institutions to resolve political conflicts, to, to perform their role, basically. Uh, and I have two questions for Paul in that respect is, uh, will that end to the end of politics, of the political, or, or, or to a new moment of sacrifice, basically? Can this tension uh, um, that you detect and this increased incapacity of political institutions to perform their role uh, uh, be um, leading to a new moment of sacrifice? And then maybe we have a reconstitution of the political. Uh, um, uh, that's one, one way to go. The, the other one is you, there's a strong link in your recent work between the failure of political institutions and the breakdown of social institutions themselves. Uh, because these social institutions are the ones that created the civic virtues that made it possible for political institutions uh, to, to, to work. So my question is, should the priority, should our priority be in working on political institutions or on the social institutions themselves. And, and, and I stop here for now. Thank you, Miguel. We're gonna to have to park all these questions as we move on to Amalia, right? Uh, and I'll try to give some time at the end for Paul to address them, if he wants to. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to make uh, three general comments about the, the, the model uh, of, of thinking the political that uh, Paul is advancing and the method he's uh, using and, and the reach of, of the theory. So it's three very general, uh, very general comments. Um, so the first one is, is this model of the foundation of the, of the, foundation of the, the political community being funded on, on love and sacrifice. So that would be like a model uh, the erotic foundations of the political community as opposed to the, to the uh, consent-based or self-interest and reason-based uh, form of political association. And I have um, a, few, a few problems that even though, I mean, after all this, is, we've talked a lot about love and sacrifice during these two days, but I, I still remain uh, worried about some uh, of, the, of the key concepts. So the first one is this connection between uh, love and sacrifice. Uh, why we have to understand this as a pair? Um, I, I'm still not convinced that we should understand them necessarily as a, a, as a, 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 in, in connection to, what we, to one another. They are connected, obviously, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, yeah. right. Judeo-Christian tradition, Judeo love Christian. And, and sacrifice. But it, of right. course, this is not the only tradition, and I don't think this is the only uh, a concept of, of, of love that uh, might be used for, for politics. Um, in this conception, love has somehow is somehow self-destructive, uh, but can there not be love without sacrifice? Possibly, yes. Uh, not in the Judeo-Christian tradition, but uh, again, it's not the only way to understand love. Uh, it's not that all love uh, uh, that is used for, for political thinking has to be tragic in the way in which uh, it is when we tie it up to sacrifice. And there can be also be sacrifice without love as well, um, uh, constantly. I mean, one can sacrifice um, for one's nations uh, out of an uh, inflated conception of the self. So it can be an act of arrogance and self-aggrandizing. It can be an act of honor. Some people would do it for honor, not so much for love of the country. I mean, if we think of Eastern perspectives, for instance, on that, uh, that will primarily be a, a reason for sacrificing that is not related so much to love of the country as to a, a, a conception of the self in which uh, the, the honor uh, plays, uh, the value of honor plays a, a very important role. So I, I think that, um, I, I don't mean to say that love and sacrifice cannot be uh, making a, a good pair and that maybe it's, this is the way of understanding the way in which love should, display, uh, should, uh, should have relevance in the political domain, but maybe this is not the only way. And we will need some argument of why this is the way in which we should understand uh, a lot for political purposes. Then on sacrifice as well, and this has been picked on on several of the talks, uh, it is combined with death. So this is another pair that I'm not totally convinced. <laughs> like why sacrifice has necessarily to be understood coupled with the idea of death. 
uh, it's a bit of a military, militaristic understanding of sacrifice as being uh, only uh, a matter of being killed or being willing to kill or being killed. Uh, but there are other ways in which we could understand uh, sacrifice, like uh, in, in Maria's uh, uh, comment, for instance, is shall we or not sacrifice national identity for the purposes of supranational identity? This is a sacrifice of one's identity, which does not involve uh, uh, death. Uh, uh, her answer was no, but. Uh, this is an open question, right? Uh, austerity as well, the, the, the politics of austerity, it means sacrifice and it does not involve death. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier um, in the first uh, session, uh, one can sacrifice one's cultural aff affiliation to uh, when one moves to a different country, uh, for when migrants move to a different country, they might also sacrifice a part of the self that is a metaphorical killing. Uh, the, the, the cultural affiliations of the, of the political community of origin, uh, it's not, it doesn't involve death. So this is another pair that I, I, I think will require also um, some type of argument of why do we, have, do we have to understand sacrifice in the context of politics as necessarily associated with death. And the third pair that I don't, I'm not totally convinced that this connection between love and emotion on the one hand and sharp contrast to reason and self-interest on the other, so that your model will be completely an alternative to this other model. Uh, for that to be the case, we will need to rely on a conception of love and emotion on the one hand, and reason and self-interest on the other, in which there are no connections, but of course there are important connections. I mean, reason and emotion are not completely separated departments, uh, 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 neither in philosophy nor in psychology either. They are intertwined, there is not a sharp division, so um, there is some question about whether by proposing this model as an alternative to the other one, you're not relying perhaps on a dichotomy that is not as clearly defined uh, as, or, or most people don't think that it is as clearly defined as it will need to be the case for the model to be in contrast with the other one. Um, so I, I would like to suggest uh, that maybe perhaps whether there could be a third model uh, in which communities based not in self annihilation of self extermination, <laughs> which would be ultimately this idea of, of funding uh, the political order on, on the idea of sacrifice. And uh, it will not be uh, based either on self interest, that will be the contract um, based uh, model, but rather self realization. Uh, so realization. <laughs> in which we enter in, in community because um, this is the way in which we can self-realize. Uh, and it's, it really is diametrically opposed to the idea that when we enter into the in, in community, we are actually willing to self-terminate -ter us. Self, yeah, self-termination is on the contrary, the self-realization that will be like the, the main motive driving or the, the main foundation of the, of the political community. And this will come with a different type of, I think of exemplary citizens and archetypes. Uh, it will not be perhaps the veteran or the hero, but rather uh, the beautiful citizen, of course. And then uh, my second point, uh, I'm taking too much time. Yes. <laughs> okay. Then I just I just say really fast. <laughs> You're not my, taking too much time. This, there, there is yeah, there is no. I know. I know. So I, I'm conscious of time. So I will just um, mention that um, the second one has to do with the autonomy of the political. The fact that uh, and this is something I've been missing in the discussion. I come from a different uh, tradition of, um, uh, of philosophical thought. So for me, it's still difficult to accept that. Uh, ethics or morality just was not on the table at all, <laughs> basically. Uh, so um, I, 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 I agree, and I think uh, Martin in his paper put it very nicely, that of course we don't want to reduce uh, that the political domain is autonomous and it, it, it should uh, exclude, uh, we should exclude the view that it should be reduced to uh, uh, the rationality of the political discourse to the moral point of view. I completely agree, but is there any space for the moral point of view? Um, it is difficult for me of, to think about politics without not providing some space for the political point of view. Uh, I think there should be some conditions under which self-sacrifice is unjustified. Uh, even contracts have conditions and so, likewise, I think self-sacrifice should also uh, have some conditions under which it is justifiable or not. Uh, because otherwise uh, we might end up justifying um, uh, 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 really atrocious acts in the name of, of, of community. I mean, of course, political, the political actors can be very convincing and very persuasive in, the, in conveying the message that this is an action that requires self-sacrifice. So we need to have some type of space for uh, 
this willingness to self-sacrifice must not be impervious to critical judgment, and the critical judgment will come, of course, from the domain of morals. I could extend this argument to the court, but I would not. So persuasiveness, uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm persuaded <laughs> that this is a very important criterion and, uh, for both calling for political actions and, and judicial opinions, but I, I, I still feel that there should be some place for argument and this means for moral reasons as well. Um, and finally, and uh, very briefly, it's about the potential applications of this, uh, of the of the method uh, that you are proposing. Because you, you say in political theology, actually, that political theology, in political theology, the book, <laughs> that political theology helps explain American exceptionalism. Um, uh, but that there is no political theology for the European Union. <laughs> you, you said that in writing. But we've seen today that there is, uh, the possibility of using your theory uh, to explain systems other than the, than the US. And American exceptionalism has not been discussed in the last two, in the last two days. Uh, so I just thought that it will be perhaps uh, interesting to reflect upon the fact of, of whether in fact uh, um, this, um, uh, you develop this method so that it will account among other things for the exceptionality of American experience. Um, however, from the perspective of a cultural analysis of law, if law is a product of human culture, which it is, uh, human culture, which is different from non-human cultures in a number of ways, and of course, one human culture will be different from another one, um, and different political experiences will not necessarily be commensurable, but there are some features that bring together all human cultures as opposed to non-human cultures. And if law is going to be a product of that, it would be surprising if it's a method like the cultural analysis of law could not be applied to systems other than the US. Uh, so it, it is, uh, uh, it seems that it will then, then be like a method that is ad hoc just to explain that particular experience and cannot be generalized that will fail against the method. But in fact, that we have seen it can be generalized. So what it tells, I think, is against uh, American exceptionalism. Maybe American exceptionalism is more um, engineered, me, perhaps. <laughs> well, and I, I'll stop here. Okay, I'll just take two minutes, right? Because uh, I only have one thing to say, really. Uh, and it's it's actually linked to the the, the kind of administrative point. Uh, if, if if you're imagining writing a uh, an intellectual biography of Paul, or yeah. the, the introduction, that's actually on Paul's work, I think there's a couple of framing questions which you have to ask, and they're, they're, they're really basic ones, but they've been there in the background uh, uh, for the, uh, the last two days. And one is about time, and one is about space. The time one is is about the continuity of Paul's work from from the beginning until now. You know, it's something that uh, people talk of and they mention, and I think I think in particular, Denny today, the uh, I also have my views, which I don't have time to expound about the. I see a, a discontinuity between a lot of the earlier work on sacrifice and the more recent work on system and order. Uh, I'm not saying it's a necessarily a tension, but I think there's a discontinuity there. I think there's also some tensions in this work, which may be read as discontinuities in terms of the work over time. But one of the interesting things about this is that Paul, Paul is very, uh, he's very, he's very modest about these sorts of things. So if you ask these questions to Ronald Dworkin, for example, he would say, well, I changed all the terminology, but the ideas remained exactly the same. I don't talk about Hercules anymore, but it's still in there. Um, but Paul doesn't say that. He says, all oh, right, I'm interested that people see continuities between my book. You know, I think there's some false policy there. Of course there's continuity, there's massive continuity, but you kind of want, you want other people to find that continuity. <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, and, uh, but it is interesting, I think that, 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 that perspective, and it's, it's it says it's, it's also, I think there's something very interesting there about the scholar and the career of the scholar, the career of the thinker, and what one thinks about the, you know, what, what obligation you might or might not have in terms of internal consistency. But the way that you constantly throw out your audience is interesting. Uh, I think the other point is about space, because much of what we've talked about in the last two days, I think uh, 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 the, the both what Miguel has said and what uh, Amalia just said are very, very much about this. And I think they've both eloquently said by the questions that they ask, are, of course, the questions you ask are generalizable beyond the American experience. Of course they are, you know, but it's something which there's an awkward dance there, you know, because you come in with this set of ideas, this rich set of ideas, you invite people to dance, 
People then dance with you, and then you say, I'm only talking about America. <laughs> but, you know, now, again, I, I, I exaggerate, you know, I exaggerate, but there's a sense in which, you know, in, in which you know that. And of course, I think, I can't, you know, this, this is a cultural you know, analysis of law. Everything, everything, everything about the terminology reeks of universality, right? You know, this is, these are things that are generally true. The things you say about, about constitutional thinking are very, very broad. The things you say about reason and project are broad. The things you say about sacrifice are incredibly broad, you know? And, uh, and of course, you know, the empirical analysis is going to be very, very different. But I think it is... You know, and maybe the answer to that that you're saying is, well, if you like the CAN method, get on with it and just deal with it in your particular context. You know, but it's not for me to answer that particular question. But I would say that, you know, certainly, you know, whoever gets to write the intellectual biography of Paul Kahn is going to have to address these two questions. Of his name. Okay, I'll just leave it there. So really, I think uh, maybe the last word now, and I know we've only got 10 minutes, should go to Paul if he if he has time to address. So, ben, 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 do you have? I, I said to you, I promised you like an intervention. So, uh, do you have anything you want to say? Neil, that's very generous of you. I, I you don't need to make space for it. I, the one one thing, perhaps, though, I'll say just before um, what we're most interested in hearing, which is kind of Paul's reflections on all of this. Um, one element that's been <laughs> present. For me, and in, in listening um, over the last couple of days, has been uh, sort of the, the the remarkable or the notable, at least, absence of um, colonial realities in the way that we're theorizing here around the political. And Paul and I have chatted about this a little bit. Um, so there's a way in which um, the way we've been chatting, at least in these terms, have imagined that. Um, Europe has not been um, shaping its identity, playing in very complicated ways in sovereignty work, in colonial realities, and in in the United States, which is where I've chatted with Paul about this a little bit, um, that there is um, really complex um, relationships taking place in terms of contested sovereignties in the Americas and that this is a defining feature as well and here I'm thinking about the ways in which as Paul um, continues to rewrite his story of the 19th century that the um, relationship with um, Indigenous North Americans has a much bigger potential role to play in the shaping of our thinking through the myth making and the indeed even sacrifice that's involved in this. And, um, you know, I think that's true for political theory more generally and something that I'm interested in thinking um, Paul's work in relationship to as well. I'll, I'll say something about that um, from Canada, which is that I think there's a way in which when I first studied with Paul um, 20 years ago, the, um, the terms in which he spoke around uh, um, sovereignty, sacrifice, these sorts of things uh, were quite unusual and foreign to translation into a Canadian setting. Um, except in one respect, which is one that travels to where you are right now, not, not too badly, which is Quebec, right? Which is the way secession and independence is a big part of our conversations right now, which I know, of course, is of interest to Paul. Um, but um, the reckoning with the colonial um, and indigenous experience in Canada over the last 10 years or so has really quite shaken um, the way in which Canadian political theory has thought about these concepts and how they're at play. And um, the conversation, the place um, that I'm, I'm also interested in us thinking through a little bit um, and where I've uh, encouraged Paul to say, I think there's something quite valuable in the terms that he puts into play and, and the ideas he puts into motion um, is in this question of how the making of um, America and the construction of European identity too, I think, has an awful lot to do as well with the encounter with contested sovereignties in 
um, indigenous peoples and the reality of of colonialism. So um, that's just one thread that that I find um, uh, interesting, um, interestingly absent from the way that we've been chatting so far, despite its very, very close connections to some of our themes. Um, so I, maybe I'll just say that as something that's been on my mind over the last um, two days. And, and uh, Neil, I hope that's brief enough. That's uh, it's as brief as it was. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Benjamin. Actually, it, it was the uh, uh, one of the things that uh, Sina has been working on. She's left is very much is, is the is the role of imperialism in construction of European constitutional identity. And I'm just about to send you an email. Her most recently. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, so let me start just by saying thank you to everyone, uh, and uh, it's been. Fascinating uh, and also exhausting uh, <laughs> uh, for me, but uh, thanks uh, for all the comments and thoughts and taking me seriously and, and, and everything else. And uh, I, I appreciate that. And you, you should all send me your work and uh, I'll put it in the big pile of people to read and, and make my way through it as, 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 as much as I can. So, so, so that's the first point. Um, let me uh, just respond a little bit randomly to some of the things in this last barrage. Uh, which uh, uh, are, are um, uh, you know, stuck uh, in, in my mind. Um, so, um, but first on time and space, um, you know, have my views changed over time? I hope so. <laughs> um, but, I, but I certainly think there's, there's been continuity uh, as well, continuity. You know, all of this work, in my view, goes back to my doctoral work in philosophy. Uh, and uh, so, you know, if, if you're going to write that biography, you, you better get a hold of the, of the thesis <laughs> uh, as, as well. Um, so, um, but uh, so there's a cluster of concerns I've, I've had, and, and the cluster has to do with conceptual change, uh, movement over time, uh, uh, you know, base, basic ideas of order. Um, uh, and uh, how best to think about the way in which, you know, we we imagine order. Uh, now, you know, I, I guess in some ways I'm like working. You know, when I started out, I, I didn't have the right, I didn't have the same vocabulary. You know, I didn't, I didn't wasn't able to speak about social imaginary for like 20 years when I started this. But mm. it turned out that's what I was talking about. Uh, so, so, so the I, so the the terms uh, change, but but the basic idea that. Um, you know that um, there's a kind of that, that these large structures are contested and need to be described uh, and need to be related to each other. And I you know I've tried different ways of relating to each other. I think that my earlier work is is much more um, uh, what's the word much more structural uh, as, as if you could place these things in order uh, and, mm. and, and um, there's a logic. Uh, you know I I still think that uh, to some degree, but. But I'm much more flexible uh, in, in my, I think, I hope, uh, in, in, in this. Um, and a space, now that's a hard one, you know, and uh, here, you know, I, I don't know, I don't think it's a false humility. I just think uh, it goes with the territory. The method doesn't allow me to talk about for the rest of the whole world. It allows me to talk about the thing I know <laughs> uh, and, and to explore it in some uh, detail, uh, offering a set of categories and an invitation. Uh, and, and you know, and an invitation to graduate students. You know, come, come talk to me. Tell, tell me about uh, what's going on. But, but I wouldn't be so presumptuous to try and say, well, I, I have any kind of expertise. But, but as I said, you know, often I, I think that the U.S., the subject that I know something about, you know, is a, a one. You know, is drawing on a set of common resources that are available throughout the West. That's a, so it's one instantiation of using these terms. Of course, they're going to show up. Uh, elsewhere, but the interesting question to me is, what are the differences, and how do they show up? You know, and, and what? so, so I'm not. I, I don't think I'm trying to hide this or or say that I have, you know, that I don't have universal ambitions. I mean, I wrote, you know, the origins of order. My ambition in origins of order was just this conference, in the sense that I thought we could make a lot of progress. We, everybody who thinks about these things, if we use these terms. So here's a book that tries to introduce these terms. These are the terms to try and think about, you know, legal and political order. Let's see what comes of it. And here's an example, All right? So, so my ambition is completely, I don't want to say it's imperative, it's universalist. I, I think these are good terms. 
you know, uh, and the good categories, and they'll take you a long way. Uh, but I don't have the capacity or ability to tell you exactly, you know, how is the UK going to understand the, you know, the withdrawal from the, the EU as, I, I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> uh, and um, that doesn't so, make your methodology particular. If you start going by saying the methodology is particular, now you're saying your terms are universal. The method, of, the terms are universal, but the application or the, okay, or the, or the, sure, the, right. or the you know, the, the, the relationship between these terms. I want to use these terms in conjunction with what I call thick description. Okay. Right. Um, and, um, and and I don't think I'm entitled to do more uh, given my methodology, uh, given the limits of what I know. So all the, so so I don't I don't think there's a secret about my you know my imperial ambitions. They're strong, <laughs> but you know uh, what's the word the, oh, the you, know, <laughs> you know when the British uh, the, people always talk about the way the British use the. Uh, what? No, no, no. This idea of, of using the indigenous to to, to uh, 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 operate in their place. Cargo cult. No. What? We're we talking about cargo cults here. No, 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 no. no. You know, so India is ruled not just by, by, by indirect by, rule. What? What? Indirect rule. Yeah, indirect rule. This is my ambition. Indirect, indirect rule. rule. Right. Indirect rule. I want you guys to do the work for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 but okay, so. Um, well, that, that's uh, the first set of uh, ideas that stuck. Um, Amalia raised a lot of interesting points uh, that I want to say a, a little bit too. Um, uh, make, working up from the, from the, from the, from the base, uh, your, your concern about the absence of uh, reused moral categories. Um, so I think that political. Uh, a discourse and political argument is full of morality. I, I think what we argue about in politics is morality. That, that's the content. I'm, I mean, I, I'm kind of describing the structure of the narratives and the and, and the and the way in which you know we we imagine order. But I'm not telling you the content of the conversation. The content of the conversation is justice. And it's our views about morality. That's that's what's informing these these debates. They're not absent. They're the, they're the the thing that we're worried about. <laughs> Uh, in, in this, so so then, you know, endlessly, I, I use the uh, analogy of, of family, and, and the way I use it in this context is, say, look, like, you know, I love my children, and it's important to understand the autonomy of love. I love it, you know, and, and to understand that, but that doesn't make me unconcerned about their moral character, right? Because I love them, I want them to be just. I want them to be moral. You don't split these things off, but it is true that you know, and again, this follows on, on your point. Um, uh, I won't abandon them if they're unjust, right? But love is autonomous. It's independent of that. I want them to be just. But, and again, your point, there may become a point in which the injustice becomes so great that I have to abandon them. Um, so, so these things aren't, you know, um, autonomous in the sense of, you know, completely separate domains of meaning. They are interacting all the time. And my claim is, um, we can't just worry about justice. There's other forms of meaning and other forms of order that have to be identified, but it's never meant to say, uh, you know, that, that we can slight justice or not be concerned about it. That's that's critical to politics. And we don't have to make these decisions that, as you say, well, we could find ourselves sacrificing for you know, things that are immoral. Of course we can. And then we have a real problem. <laughs> what do you do? And I'm a, that, that's what I want to identify. That there is a real problem. Just telling me it's unjust doesn't tell me what to do. Because if there's more than one sort of normative claim operative here. Uh, I think, you know, I, I think about this in fictional and dramatic terms. That, uh, but, you know, I mean, the, the real problem that comes up regularly in American history is what do you do about an unjust war? What do you do? What do you do about an unjust history? What do you do about all those, you know, indigenous populations that have been that have killed in the name of American uh, of, of public life. So, so, so it's not an inquiry into justice. This is true, but it, and, 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 you know, people also ask me why I don't write about justice and morality. And I say, well, I have nothing interesting to say about it. Uh, and, um, and, and in some ways, I, I think that's right. You know, I, I don't think I have any extraordinary views about what's just and what's unjust, but, but I never meant to dismiss it or to think it's not an essential part of our political discourse or 
what politics is in some way trying to achieve, but it's also politics is an existential project and a particular existential project in my view uh, that isn't isn't explained by morality. Um, so um, so that's that's the, the first point. And then this is another pro point about imperialism. You know, um, and here we have to be a little bit careful about language, and maybe I'm not careful enough. Um, but and not a lot turns on the language we use. Um, but if, if you can tell me that, you know, uh, here's a political order that is not organized at base around friends and enemies or the possibility of sacrifice or the, the understanding of sacrifice as an act of love. Um, well, that, that's a very awkward term in, in our usage now. I'm always a little nervous about what people think about that term. Um, I, I would never say, you know, well, that's that's uh, either not, you know, a deficient form of politics or a failure of politics or impossible. I would never use that one. I'd say, fine, it's interesting. It's interesting, uh, and and uh, and and that's a, you know, it, it, so I never meant in my inaccurate descriptions of the EU. Although I must say, I'm a little suspicious about the claims about the EU to the degree that they depend upon the Ukraine. What's happened in Ukraine, Ukraine in the last month? Uh, but but maybe what do I know? Yeah. And, uh, and so, um, but I would never say that's you know I, I would say well that's in, that's interesting and maybe that's the future. I don't I don't know that I don't think that politics is the only form of meaning available, and I don't think it's here forever. Uh, and you know, and I, and I don't think it's good or bad. I, I say about that it's like asking whether Christianity is good or bad. You know, politics is the world through which I find myself. Uh, uh, displaying certain kinds, goes to Denny's point, certain kinds of, of meaningful claims upon me. Uh, uh, often I wish that the meaningful claims weren't made upon me, but that's the world in which I, I find myself. Uh, and uh, so whether there are other alternative possibilities or not, I, I don't know. Um, now, a sacrifice, you know, here again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm this is continuity over time. <laughs> uh, but but I've always thought of, of politics and sacrifice. Um, I, you have to be really careful. I have to be really careful when I think about this. Um, uh, and when I think about the sacrifice is kind of a limit case of the political or, or the limit case of the political imaginary, or the foundation of the political imaginary. I mean, sacrifice is like that. Uh, and and um, and that's either good or bad. I I I think it just defines a way of experiencing the state um, that is um, the one that I find myself within. And, and again, I'm a product of the 20th century uh, and, and deeply uh, important in understanding uh, the 20th century. So, um, you know, I, I'm, uh, uh, this is a thought that came to me, I don't know if it's a good example, but maybe a bad example, but, 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 you know, when I, um, uh, well, in the, in the United States, let's say, or when I'm abroad, I visit military cemeteries, right? Um, uh, I visit battlefields, right? It means something to me to be a Gettysburg, uh, it, 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 you know? Uh, and, um, and, and so what's the equivalent for the EU? Uh, and uh, if you tell me, well, uh, forget about the EU for a moment, but but here's a political state right, that doesn't put the, the 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 military cemetery as a place of respect or honor or whatever whatever it doesn't write its history around such things. I, I'd be really interested in that, uh, but, but it's not the world in which uh, I find politics uh, uh, operating. Uh, not a good nor bad, uh, and you know I, I don't I don't want to claim that. The, you know, any kind of unique privilege claim on the political. But the political that I've had to deal with, you know, since, you know, the set, I was 16 years old and the, and the military draft was there and Vietnam was there, was this other thing, the claim of right to my life. Uh, and, and put it, not, not only made that claim, but, but put it issue in the narrative of my, you know, the historical narratives of who I am as a political citizen, a sacrificial history. Uh, and um, say, well, you know, don't, don't think about sacrifices, you know, Gettysburg, think about it as paying your taxes. Uh, or uh, that's not 
the same thing, uh, I, I think. Um, this has come, become a big issue for me lately in some way, because I've been writing about local government, local towns and local communities, and of course I'm not sacrificing communities in this way. Their identities are more you know, through the kind of sacrifices you're talking about. You know? So Ben was talking about this yesterday, about the volunteer. You know, well, a volunteer, you could say, sacrifices. You could something is to take on all the uh, responsibilities of, of, a, of a public sort. Uh, and, and that's all true. Uh, yeah, but but you know what interests me is is the way in in which um, political identity at the local level relates to a national political identity. It's those volunteers uh, in, in the end who see continuity between the local and the national and that national abilities uh, part of the political union. They're they're the ones those are who are marching on Memorial Day carrying the U.S. flag. Uh, uh, so so again, I don't want to claim that's universal. I just want to claim that, the, that there's an interesting question in my mind about the relationship between these things. Last point, which uh, goes to some things Danny said, some things others said, or some things Miguel said. Um, look, I, I thought for some years now that the political economy um, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, this you know, 20th century political phenomenology Right, may not have much of a place in, in, in the 21st century and that, you know, who, who can believe, anything? who can believe that the confirmation process of Kavanaugh was a shedding of a political identity and a taking off, who could believe that, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and, you know, and, and uh, the one we just saw with uh, uh, Brown is, uh, you know, even worse in, 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 in many ways. Um, so who could believe any of that? And that, uh, and that's what made me turn to the local to see what's actually going on that's undermined the conditions of the in which we find our politics that have been possible. Uh, and that's an interesting inquiry, right? Um, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure of, a, a, anymore that, that that analysis was, that, that fear was right, because increasingly I worry about the following. That, uh, you, you, uh, so my prior view was the polarization of American political culture polarization of American culture flat out, right, um, uh, was uh, uh, undermining our commitment to the political. It was simply dissolving as we gave up uh, and, and entered our separate teams. Uh, but, you know, I'm not talking about civil war. I, I think we may be seeing a repoliticalization, uh, a, a red and the blue, so to speak, haven't abandoned politics uh, in the sense that I talk about it, but they're constructing themselves as friends and enemies. And that we may actually be entering a very dangerous moment of politics, not a, not a demilitarization one, but rather a re, re you know a redefinition, a revigorous re, re I don't know what it's called a, 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 a vigor vigorization is that a word? <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it may be coming back at us, uh, and um, uh, so we may be entering an even more dangerous moment. And, you know, I, and I published this paper somewhere in uh, you know, a version of this paper and, and one of the, there was a bunch of responses and they were, you know, you can imagine they were split. One said, you're kidding, we're not in a civil war uh, because, you know, there aren't people dead in the streets. And the other one said, we've been in a civil war for 10 years, there are dead people dead in the streets. <laughs> you just haven't noticed. Uh, so I don't, I don't know which one is going to happen. Um, uh, but I do know it's, a, it's, it's an issue. Uh, 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 and, um, and uh, anyway, I'll stop there. But thank, should, thank you again. But before you stop completely, can I just, just for Miguel's sake, you know, even yeah. if you accept that distinction between different types of, of, of uh, sacrifice, and you take your stronger version, why can that not be restructured as about faith? Yeah, yeah, advice? I wanted to say something about that. Um, I don't really have any trouble with that. Uh, faith, you know, um, I, I do think. You know, in, in my early work, more back this time, I used to talk about will, and I think this is a very awkward term for getting at what I want to get at. Um, and people would say, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, will, will is a, a, a term that has a long philosophical and religious tradition, and we have to understand that. I don't mean, I don't mean consent, you know, I don't mean subjective preference, I mean, you know, uh, the will in a kind of a Hegelian sense of the objective spirit and, and all of that. And oh, I, I actually don't want to say more about that. Uh, but, but um, uh, so can we talk about that, 
the faith that motivates, you know, what, what and, and I think, you know, if you, you think about love, another awkward term, uh, I think it's appropriate to use the language of faith, you know, have faith in, in, in the other, faith in, the, in, in your uh, uh, commitments to each other. Um, and uh, so, so I don't have any, I, I, I think that's, you know, a, a, a useful term and, and um, it also, you know, has a strange religious, has this quality of religiosity without making a kind of direct theological commitment. You know, we talk about faith without having to talk about faith in God. Um, uh, so, so it's a useful term, but, uh, and, and it's a useful term to understand the conditions under which political sacrifice can take place. I think that's, that's very true. Uh, and, um, uh, and, but of course, you know, others, there are other grounds of sacrifice. You're right, they're just not political in, in a sense in which I'm uh, observing. The, uh, but, but, but faith in the nation, faith in the, his, in the, in the, in, in the possibilities of maintaining your political identity, all, all that's right. So, so I don't, but I don't see it as a, as a displacement of the idea of sacrifice, but rather as an elaboration of the conditions under which we think of sacrifice as possible. A person without faith, you know, it also takes us back to the Abraham story, which I always like, like, like to use as well. So, so it has lots of virtues, but I don't see it as displacing, but rather a better elaboration. Um, now, let me say one last word about the, the, the uh, Amaya's uh, critique of the harshness of my dichotomies, uh, which I've often been criticized about, you know, and it, it's just a true fact about my way of thinking that I, I like to use dichotomies, you know, uh, and uh, it's probably not great, but it is true. And, you know, um, it reminds me of what my, my spouse Catherine says about uh, uh, the odds of anything happening, she says, they're always 50 50, either it happens or it won't. <laughs> um, so I, I like to think that way too. <laughs> Not a, 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 you know. <laughs> it makes life a lot simpler uh, in, in some way. But, but you know, and, and I rarely do this, but I do think, uh, uh, you know, for sake of shortness of time, in, in, in putting liberalism in its place, I have a chapter, at least a chapter. Uh, in, in which I say, well, there are these three categories, three, not, not three, right? Reason, will, I think, and interest, uh, interest right? Uh, but what I try and do is show that all three change their meaning as we start with one or the other. You know, each of them has a different, uh, you know, a different sense of what, what the other is, depending on the perspective from which we look. So, so reason isn't a, reason in my mind isn't a single thing, right? Or reason, uh, it's not reason versus will, it's if we approach politics from a perspective of will or faith or whatever we want to say, what is the understanding we have of reason? Not that we're not, we think of ourselves as unreasonable, right? We're always reasonable. It's, it's just that we're, we, we think about it in, in a different way. Uh, and, it's, and each of these categories can be thought of that way. So, so I don't think of these categories as, you know, there's reason that is enlightenment science and there's faith, which is you know, um, irrational belief. I think that they're, again, they're always structuring uh, attitudes and structuring debates uh, and the terms are changing. They're very flexible uh, uh, in, in, in that sense. So, so um, now that's all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just uh, there. Well, to... well, thanks to everyone. I just want to say quickly one thing about a uh, project for publication. I think we're going to submit a proposal to the German Law Journal, um, both because it is a good journal, uh, widely read, and secondly, because this is one of the few journals that will be able to accommodate 10 to 12 pages. So this is going to be a long special issue. Uh, the good thing on one hand, and this good thing, is that the deadline for submitting a proposal for the special issue is end of July, if I remember right. It was going to be later than the day. Yeah. So, uh, so there will be a bit of time before we'll be in touch again with a clear, uh, I would say, timeline in order to assemble uh, the special issue. So probably we'll be thinking about what the end of the year. Oh, yeah. 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 I will say definitely before the end. Of the before year. the end of the year. Okay. Maybe not that much before the end of the year, but uh, 
yes, yes. And yeah, I mean, and about lens, I think we need to look at this. Uh, pick the general journal for brains. Yeah, yeah. Look, my sense is that there's obviously a few papers which are ready, but I was also really encouraged by the fact that, you know, even though we didn't necessarily see other papers, clearly they exist somewhere in some sort of draft form. And uh, that's great, you know. And uh, uh, yeah, and I think, you know, the good thing, German law journal is well read. Uh, it is, it also has this nice sense of being European, but not only European. <laughs> it's very good at dealing with topical uh, subjects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, you know, we could easily get a contract with OUP or CUP, whatever. But to be honest, it, you know, in, in these days, it's not worth it. You know, the, the, the stuff just gets buried. You know, in collections, I think it's much better than this special issue, uh, and it really is well read. And now, of course, it's also well organized because it's now run by CUP, so you know, all of that helps. So unless anyone's getting objections. Uh, that's the way we'll go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a rejection, just a clarification. You said something about July and something about yeah, the. Don't yeah, I, don't know, I don't, don't, know, don't know, know what that means. No, no, sorry. The, 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 the proposal we have to, they, they have an annual call for special issues for Hope for Five. It's usually September or October, they brought it forward to July. So we have to submit that proposal to them, which will just be a short proposal. It may have some of the abstracts or we will narrativize that in some sort of way. They'll say, they will say yes, right? I'm pretty sure. If they don't say yes, should we? Uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> Why do you say that? Like, I mean, uh, well, yeah, well <laughs> look, you know. <laughs> he wants to make I mean, a gesture know, towards yeah. sacrifice. Yeah, I know, like, you know, I mean, some of the editors used to be my students and things like I mean, that. Have, <laughs> you, have you already <laughs> talked to? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 we've spoken yeah, to yeah. either reason or okay, right. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, if if there's a problem, then I'll let you know. But uh, and uh, my 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 credibility will be shot, <laughs> just like yours was last night when you couldn't find the rest of. The... <laughs> but I did find it. You did find it, and I'll get this published eventually. But the uh, but I think the idea then would be maybe October, November, or whatever. Yes, but we'll have to be again guided by them because maybe their their acceptance will be conditional upon us making it available at a particular point, you know, in the year. But, uh, but, uh, okay, good. Yeah, well, so thank thanks. Yeah, thanks everyone, and thanks for our online people. That's that's been great for for Benjamin, and also I mean this has been real sacrifice in both cases. <laughs> One case getting up very early in the morning, second one just hanging <laughs> around in the town just like out of focus. And uh, so it's like it's good that people kind of enact their theoretical commitments. But uh, so, do you want to say anything finally? No, no. I mean, thank you very much. I really enjoy your talk. <clears throat> thank you so much to Marco and Neil. It was a wonderful com conference. So, thank you to the co conveners. We're very grateful. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Hi. 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 Hi.